Research Group. At the moment, he is the country director of the International Space Weather Initiative. Yeah, that's all about him. Professor Jha, you're welcome, and the floor is yours. Morning, everyone. Thank you, do, uh, Dr. Dorothy, for the introduction. And then you take us to space. Huh? So, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the URC past five years efforts to improve quality STEM education. I will talk about some achi achievement and new perspectives. The, the University of Rwanda is the largest higher institution of learning, public, uh, including six colleges, one of them the College of Education. And the College uh, ed of Education, University of Rwanda, have a primary mandate to become an internationally a known center of excellence in producing professionally qualified teachers. It has tasked to develop curricula and offer high level educational program and training that prepare teachers for all school level as well as cadre of educational professional. Uh, it has two main school and two centers, the School of Education the School of Inclusive and Special Needs Education, the Center for Open and Distance Learning, CODEL, and the African Center of Excellence for Innovative Teaching and Learning Mathematics and Science. Major activities of the school center are teaching learning in a blended mode for undergraduates and graduates program, the training of professional teachers, educators, both in service and pre-service and the curriculum development and research. There is a reason behind why the CE uh, put much emphasis on STEM education. Uh, this is consistent with the government of Rwanda Vision 2050 and the sustainable development goal. Four, that quality of life is linked to the quality of education. And the national strategy uh, for transformation ending next year, highlight that they need to promote science, technology, engineering, and mathematics across all levels of education by increasing the capacity of STEM research centers and uh, science school and to ensure, to ensure implementation of the new competency-based curriculum with effective integration of ICT in teaching and learning. So as you can see, uh, when you look at the current enrollment of uh, College of Education in undergraduate program, uh, the student population is around 8,000, with more than half enrolled in STEM-related subject. The, the, the similar situation is an, in the postgraduate program with most of, most of uh, masters of uh, in education and PhD students doing coursework and research in STEM-related subjects. In the past five years, the, the way to improve uh, quality STEM learning by the College of Education concentrated in four areas by focusing on development and the review of program to align them with the new STEM competency-based curricula and the development of uh, continuous professional development program, uh, especially for in-service teachers. And the CE invested in putting up STEM infrastructure by equipping the science, mathematics, and the ICT lab, but also the focus in research and training on innovative STEM pedagogical approach 
we have been focusing on inquiry-based learning approaches and, and the problem-based learning approaches. So the equipping uh, quality STEM lab uh, provide opportunity for teachers to provide uh, practical based learning of STEM. And CE is also ensuring that both pre-service and in-service teachers are equipped with the knowledge required, the technology and the pedagogy to conduct effective STEM classroom in any classroom environment. Uh, we promote a STEM active learning pedagogy where uh, teachers are able to practice active learner-centered inquiry-based STEM learning to conduct and improve the quality of lab experiment. We, f we, we emphasize more hand-on activity, practical work, and we encourage uh, the teachers to use, effectively use the open educational resources, including interactive simulation model animation. We, we have been uh, encouraging in service and pre-service teachers to use uh, the famous 5E instructional model for STEM, which has demonstrated to be not only learner-centered, active, but also inquiry-based uh, mode of delivery of all STEM subjects. In the past five years, uh, CE, the College of Education, collaborated with uh, numerous uh, funded project locally and internationally. As an example, the, the MasterCard funded the leaders in teaching which has organized uh, this conference. We appreciate that because this is the first forum where educational researchers, postgraduate students are able to, to disseminate their research funding. Uh, in this conference, there have been a lot of uh, presentation related to STEM education, we appreciate. But also the MasterCard funded uh, project supported the URC lecturers in equipping them with resources teaching resources to eff effectively conduct a STEM lesson by providing them with computer, laptop, and other tools related. They support also a STEM student to go in school and familiarize with, with the teaching environment under what is called the practicum. Uh, CE researchers received funding from the MasterCard Foundation and they are able to conduct research. Other remaining uh, institution, the African Institute of Mathematical Science, VVOB, in collaboration with the African Center of Excellence for Innovative Teaching, Learning, Mathematics, and Science, and the Rwanda Basic Education Project under funding by the World Bank, collaborate with the CE to implement, uh, to train the teachers, in service teachers on uh, continuous professional development, such as CPD in educational mentorship and coaching for STEM teachers. And at the moment, the teaching is in progress and over 3,000 teachers across the country have been trained under this uh, collaboration. And it is still going on. Center of Excellence, College of Education is in a partnership with the University of Colorado, USA, uh, to, and has uh, involved in training high school teachers, including some uh, UR uh, CE staff teaching STEM subject to effectively use uh, the FET simulation because our research fundings has demonstrated that when they are effectively used, they improve learning of uh, STEM subject because they are more interactive. And they were trained as TOTs able to disseminate and going in school and at university to train the other colleagues. I will highlight the, the CE, which hosts a funded project by the World Bank that is the Rwanda Quality Basic Education Human Capital Development and a subcomponent professional development of mathematics and teachers uh, involved much in creating and supplying a package of integrated instructional tool for mathematics and science 
and also train, support teachers and school leaders for effective use of new tools in the classroom. They are developing scripted lesson, STEM scripted lesson, use of virtual science lab, training of project-based learning, but also providing STEM teachers with the required resources to laptop and projectors, formative assessment tools such as clickers and clickers and math and science uh, kits. And under this collaboration, QBE and DC, many uh, school subject leaders and their leaders and their head teachers have been trained and it is a big achievement. The training is continuing up to, extended up to 2025. It is important to talk uh, about when we talk about the STEM education quality at the College of Education, we, we need to talk about the African Center of Excellence for Innovative Teaching and Learning Mathematics and Science. Six years ago, the University of Rwanda won funding for, from the World Bank, and on a competitive basis, we won five uh, four centers of excellence, including one hosted by the College of Education, that is the African Center of Excellence for Innovative Teaching and Learning Mathematics and Science. This funding was under AC2 project for East and Southern Africa country to strengthen the higher education institution to deliver quality postgraduate education and build collaborative research in priority area. The main objective of the center is to design and implement quality PhD and med program in mathematics and science education, to use innovative pedagogical approach that explicitly address the competency gap, gaps among graduates, and to conduct research with main focus on effective STEM education that can address development challenge of the society. But also the center is involved in outreach program going into school to sensitize young people on need to enroll in mathematics and help them to improve mathematics learning. The center is running eight programs, including four programs at PhD level, PhD by research, in biology education, chemistry, mathematics, and physics education, and the masters of education for program in biology, education, chemistry, mathematics, and physics education. The center has also developed a continuous professional development for innovative teaching mathematics and science, which I said is being implemented in a collaboration together with other partners, basically to train in service teachers. So in just five years, the African Center of Excellence has become an African hub for professional STEM educators. In five years, current enrollment enrolled uh, 20, 225 students enrolled in med masters of education program coming from nine African countries, include 53 females. And among these uh, 89 of them have been graduated already. It is a big achievement. Similarly to postgraduate to PhD by research enrollment, up to now 46 students are already in PhD by research program, also coming from nine African countries. Of course, many of them are coming from Rwanda. We have 15 female, three of them have already graduated, but we have already uh, 10 who have already successfully defended their PhD dissertation with hope to graduate this year. And AC has promoted the research in STEM education uh, uh, to the extent that up to now, uh, 234 research publication publi published even in good, in including 117 published in journal indexed by Scopus. The research addressed various 
areas of STEM learning, including curriculum development, integration of ICT in teaching and learning approaches, discipline-based education research for science and mathematics. I would ask you to, to give me time to just go through highlighting some of the research being done by young graduate, uh, Dr. Tengimana Teofir is a young graduate, and his focus was to address the, the challenge and issue and the solution related to implementation of competency-based curriculum. Stella from Uganda, Madam is submitted his her synopsis to defend soon and looked at problem-based learning approach that can help better learning and performance in physics learning. And uh, Dr. Kizito, among a PhD graduate, is currently uh, pursuing a postdoctoral research in equity STEM at Iowa State University. And he worked more on effective use of simulation and YouTube video and how ca they can improve mathematics, uh, physics learning and science in particular. Dr. Angel Mukuka from Zambia is currently a lecturer at Copper Belt University, Zambia. <coughs> he conducted the research of mediating effect of self-efficacy on the relationship between instruction and student mathematical reasoning. Even though the enrollment at PhD and master's level is still low for female, but those who are there are doing very well in terms of producing quality research. The two ladies here are, have already successfully defended their proposal. No, no, they defense the defense of PhD. And first one worked on effect of instructional method on pre-service science teachers learning outcome using meta-analysis, biology, and another in chemistry effect of task-based learning student understanding of chemical reaction among selected Rwanda lower secondary school in Rwanda. They did well and they passed the recruitment examination and they will soon be enrolled as full-time College of Education teaching staff. In, in mathematics and physics, uh, the only female we have, a physicist, is about also in, to complete her PhD, looked at the using of multimedia to improve the learning of quantum physics. And the College of Education also, Center of Excellence collaborated with a Japanese company, which private, which developed the software to interactive mathematics to improve uh, the learning of mathematics. And there is a PhD student and the team who conducted uh, research in a, a primary school and with evidence found that the software is actually can improve the performance and motivation in learning mathematics. STEM is inclusive. Uh, Dr. Teone Stenarinwa, a young graduate, uh, at the College of Education, conducted many research. One among them is to adopt the use of digital content to improve the learning of numeracy among children with autism spectrum disorder in Rwanda. A very good uh, paper. And the student uh, uh, who is currently assistant lecturer in mathematics at Abdul Halam, uh, Zanzibar University was interested in TPAC improving mathematics learning. Her and the other graduate from the Center College of Education, they are happy with the support and training received, saying she appreciates the URCE, African Center of Excellence for Innovative Teaching and Learning Mathematics and Science for the great support provided to her since the beginning of the PhD up to now through the seminars, training, workshop, and presentation provided by the center to help her build skills and capacity in the research field. She's happy with the support and feel confident 
uh, to come in the world of ed STEM education researchers. What is the way forward? And you see, in partnership with partner, well, European Union in Abel is looking to improve through the Center for Open and Distance Learning, is beginning the training of STEM lecturers and e-champions on online pedagogy and instructional design with the use of the EdTech solution for interactive content material and other project finance, financing STEM education through inclusive and interactive digital content in Rwanda. What are the planned activity under this project? To acquire and install mini mobile multimedia system to train staff on online pedagogy and instructional design with the use the EdTech solution for interactive content material to train staff on how to create and use quality digital content, mock and open educational resources, and how best to combine online and on-campus teaching to develop interactive digital content with the universal design learning standard and to train STEM students on the use of innovative edit text tools. Another way of focus the CE in partnership with partner is making sure to ensure STEM skills are built since the younger age and this is done by established of STEM centers. STEM centers are equipped with uh, a basic lab, uh, some kits uh, which help young uh, students to familiarize with entrepreneurship skills, creative thinking, innovation, and, and the creativity. At the center, the, the electronic and, uh, and the computer lab is already being used by, by uh, uh, high school student from the surrounding area of the College of Education. And uh, this STEM center has been established under collaboration with the STEM power mediated by the Embassy of Israel in Rwanda. The College of Education is also partnering with the REB Ministry of Education under funding by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and in the progress to establish the African Innovation STEM Center of Excellence. And like you have seen, to achieve all this, to achieve the quality STEM education, the College of Education is collaborating with local, regional, and international uh, institutions which are interested in building quality STEM capacity. And for this reason, we, we will invite all people interested to collaborate uh, with the College of Education in this area. I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Jean Wamauro, for taking us through the journey that uh, the University of Rwanda College of Education has walked uh, to embrace ICT. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, before possibly you leave, uh, we have people in the audience. We're going to take uh, two questions. I know we have internationals here who have similar programs. If there's some brief learning that you may share with us, but we want to keep it as brief as possible so that by, uh, by one we are out of here as per the program and we have a fully packed day ahead of us. So any questions from the audience? I'll be glad to pass on the mic so that uh, you maybe you respond to two before you go. Any? I'll be glad to hand over the microphone. Any question? Before I ask mine, which I don't have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for your presentation. Uh, through your presentation, you mentioned the collaboration between different stakeholders, such as World Bank, which supported the African Center. Uh, is it we are talking about sustainability. Uh, what are the plans if those stakeholders do not partner with you anymore? Like such as we are missing, if we do not have support from what bank, are those PhDs program, master's program, 
be sustained by the College of Education in particular or University of Rwanda in general. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for the good question. Sustainability of funded project is always a key, but we have already thought about it a long time ago. Currently now, uh, there is a uh, uh, meeting going on between the Ministry of Education and the University of Rwanda and the government of Rwanda to see how uh, the funding can proceed. But if it doesn't, we have already built the capacity through, we are able to generate other funded project uh, and we are sure that we will be able to sustain. I would give an example, for example, for the master's project and the PhD, the current enrollment, uh, we are receiving more offers, more teachers from Rwanda, from Africa who want to come to study the program on self-funded basis. But there is going to be more initiative uh, to, to write a project and, and uh, we are sure that we will be able to, to sustain the program. That is what I can say. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Prof. Jean. Do we have uh, another question in the audience? If not, there is a question behind there. Maybe from uh, Prof. Jalonar. Thank you, Prof, for your good presentation. I have one simple question. Uh, if someone asks you a question regarding one key uh, innovation uh, we can learn from the center, what would you tell him? Thank you. I would do, uh, it depends on your definition of innovation. But we have some, uh, our innovation are based on, uh, on teaching. I would say only at the moment that uh, the way of teaching mathematics and science and the research conducted has been applied in, in schools. The outcome of the research on improving the teaching approaches of STEM uh, such as, for example, the, the, the changing. I, I would rather not say the innovation, but the change of practice in terms of teaching and learning mathematics and science. And from the secondary school at the university teaching, there is a really practical change in terms of delivering STEM lesson. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's uh, what we have time for. A round of applause to our colleague, uh, Prof. Thank you so much. You, you just give a round of applause, and I'll tell you why after that. A, one, a, a huge one. Yeah, th that is for the panelists who, who are going to come here. Uh, so. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for your time, and uh, thank you for sharing the journey that UIC has gone through uh, in you know, embracing ICT. And uh, just to catch up on that, we are going to do our first panel, uh, actually the last panel, because this is the last day as well. And uh, it's going to be capacity building for quality STEM education, catching up from what uh, Prof uh, just told us. And I would invite I would like to invite the following people uh, to, in, to the podium so that they take it up. Uh, we invite one, uh, the moderator, Prof. Jean Dabaga. Thank you so much. And then we have uh, uh, DG uh, Dr. Nelson Barishmana. Uh, he might have had, uh, you know, other agencies. 
Uh, we want to invite Dr. Fabia Habimana, Minister of Education. You're going to have time to introduce yourselves. I want to be very brief here. We have uh, Dr. Bahati Bena, DG Nessa. You're going to know what Nessa is uh, in a moment. We have uh, a representative, uh, Building Learning Foundation, Ms. Mbabazi. We have uh, Rewis, Rwanda Association of Women in Science and Engineering. She's in the audience. She might have had an agency too. So we also had uh, a representative from VVOB, but I don't think they're in the audience. If they are, they may please be invited to the audience. So Prof. Ndabaga, I'll leave it to you to uh, take us through maybe introductions to your panelists and then we take it from there. Thank you very much, uh, MC. Thank you very much, MC. Um, it seems they are giving extra work, which I wasn't aware of, but I appreciate. So let me have a, a pleasure to invite Professor Yadaf. He's part of this panel. So you are welcome, Professor Yadaf. As Professor Yadav is arriving, I would say, judging from the beautiful presentations we have seen this morning, graphs, charts, I would say it seems the Dr. Irene and uh, Dr. Mike kept the best for the last, so that at least we go when we are full of morale and uh, a lot of motivation. So, my work is very simple, is just to try to find out how we can react to this beautiful presentation. Professor Wamahoro, if I got you correctly, a few points that, that have uh, reiterated is in terms of the STEM being inconsistent with the government policy and the uh, developmental interest. And I'm very happy if I look around, there are people who have got good responses or evidence to that. You also talked about promoting uh, science and mathematics versus competence-based curriculum. In other words, you want our science teachers or lecturers to be as competent as it may be. And so we need also to follow it up and find to what extent is this true. You know, as researchers, we always want evidence. We don't want to speculate so much. So, without further ado, let me start with the Dr. Fabie Habimana by saying that STEM surged into education scene with so much vigor. A lot of power, a lot of um, heavy statements, a lot of praises have been showered upon STEM. But what is the feedback from um, learners and graduates? Can we see this vigor? Please share with us. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Fabi Havimana. I'm working in the Ministry of Education uh, in charge of science, technology, innovation, and research. 
I'm happy to be with you today uh, as we proceed with this uh, conference. Uh, my take was to try to, uh, to highlight some of the uh, key points that the Minister of Education is taking towards STEM enhancement for quality education. As you know, the government of Rwanda, through the Ministry of Education, uh, together of course with the affiliate institution and with other partners, uh, we can uh, stipulate, for example, the, the National Council for Science and Technology and also the Ministry of ICT, all are working together to push STEM uh, to move ahead. Uh, and that we, we are trying to, to, to look for quality STEM education at all levels of education and also to, uh, to emphasize on research that can promote uh, STEM in priority areas of the government. Uh, by that, uh, we, the Ministry of Education, we have um, already um, put this in the education sector strategic plan so that the STEM is be one of the nine key pillars of our education sector plan. So uh, we also see the uh, STEM uh, in our national strategy for transformation one, which is ending in 2024. So, uh, and again, uh, we have put much uh, some education resources to help to approve the, the STEM education. I can uh, give some examples. We have provided uh, science kits in primary schools and also in secondary school, more than one. 1,200. We have also uh, tried to, to put uh, science labs and equipment in a secondary school with STEM subjects, but at this level we are still a little bit behind because uh, we, we have not reached the all schools with STEM subjects. So we, there, is a, there is still a way to go as we move forward. So backing to, to, to what is, uh, is going to, to move, maybe while you're talking about the, the graduates, if I recall the, the question, we are now uh, with the Higher Education Council. As you know, uh, most of the, our students, they are getting students run based on what they are studying. So the STEM has been given much priority so that we are reaching almost at 80% of those students getting uh, student loan in higher education. Uh, having said that, it is clear that we are getting a lot of uh, graduates with STEM subjects and as we, uh, we learn from outside world, we know that uh, there is no any country which can grow and develop without putting much attention to STEM. That's why uh, with these graduates, we think that they are going to speed up the, uh, the, the government or the, the country's economy through different areas. As you know, uh, STEM is a big, is a big uh, I know, it's wide, it's very, very broad. From medicine, ICT, mathematics, biology, chemistry, and whatever, and ICT. All these areas, agriculture, veterinary, and pharmacy, we all need these skills that we impart in those uh, students uh, at higher, from secondary school and also at high level. So we think that uh, 
their contribution towards the economic growth will be paramount and will be very important if we need to develop. That's why uh, the, government, the government of Rwanda has uh, tried to, uh, to move ahead, not only in high school, but also to call upon some international uh, bodies or universities to come here and set the universities. We can sit maybe Carnegie Mellon University and uh, we can say uh, Rwanda uh, Institute of Agriculture, uh, uh, Conservation Agriculture. We have so many, we have aims. So we, we, we think that with this contribution, these graduates will have uh, to further their education, uh, maybe for masters and PhDs, and then they will be contributing to the, gov uh, to, to the economy of the country in different areas. Maybe I can just stop here to not take too much time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Doctor. And as I said from the beginning, that I'm not a scientist, natural scientist, but I know in every academic world, we always need evidence. And you have talked about very strong reasons behind STEM, but we always need to find out, is it sinking into the students' brains and actions? So with that, I would like to turn to Dr. Bahati. What's your experience of STEM national examination performance? And what does it tell you on the STEM teaching and learning need today, Rwandan schools? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, a, a, a tricky question, but uh, I'm going to try and uh, say something about it. Um, uh, STEM, STEM uh, has been there for some years and it's being promoted in many countries uh, educational programs uh, but uh, it is more easier to uh, talk about STEM and maybe aspiring to emphasize on it uh, in our uh, educational programs and curricula but uh, uh, STEM education uh, requires a lot in terms of funding, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, teachers' uh, training and skills. So when it comes to developing countries, sometimes it's, it's hard because there are many competing priorities and sometimes funding in, in STEM uh, is maybe uh, competing with other educational or priorities. Uh, having said that, the Rwandan situation is not an exception. Yes, we have many uh, STEM programs in our schools, and uh, we have uh, uh, many students, and I think uh, some of the policies here in the country, uh, they encourage uh, the student and the other uh, higher education uh, a student to apply for STEM. There are even some of the incentives, but when you look at uh, uh, how STEM, meaning science, mathematics, engineering, are taught in our schools, uh, someone can say we are still having many problems. So the way student learn STEM is reflected in different types of assessment they do including national exams. I don't have here with me uh, all the statistics and proportions, but uh, what I can say that uh, the, the, the student performance uh, in, in STEM subject in national exams uh, is still uh, very low. And as I said, it's a reflection of how uh, STEM are being taught in our schools. Uh, so that's what I can say, not only in national exams, but uh, in, our, in all other assessment types and, and term exams. Uh, you can see that uh, students are still struggling, uh, but as I said, the performance of students in all those assessments, it's actually uh, linked to uh, ineffect ineffectiveness of teaching and learning 
uh, of STEM subject in our schools. So this is what I can say. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bahati. Uh, this juncture, uh, join me to welcome the representative of Director General of Rwanda Education Board. You are welcome, please. And uh, you came at the right time when I was thinking, am I, to, am I going to skip my boss? But then I was blessed that you have arrived. So I can direct uh, come back to you. Now, you have heard the few presentations when you have just come in. And to you, I would say, it is a truism that among STEM educators, that they need access to varietal funding, as uh, Professor uh, Wamaoro presented to us, sources of funding in order to, the, to get the latest and the greatest hand on STEM equipment. So, with that, apart from the central government funds, does REB have an opportunity in terms of organizing proposals, other um, sources of funds? Again, Dr. Bahati has touched uh, one of the reasons why. STEM performance is still a little bit low. So do you have enough source of funds to sustain STEM teaching? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I would say that uh, STEM is a, a very uh, important field, uh, looking at uh, how uh, STEM can be used also to uh, address uh, a lot of uh, challenges that we have in, in the real world. So uh, this is uh, uh, bringing up some, uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for partnership and for uh, collaboration. Uh, for example, even if we say that uh, maybe at REB we don't have uh, enough funds, but I know that uh, through a variety of um, a partnership and collaboration, uh, we are able to achieve a lot. Uh, for example, I would say like uh, we are working, Arab is working uh, closely with uh, the universities, uh, especially University of Rwanda, and uh, we have a lot of uh, programs working together. We have different projects uh, with uh, the World Bank. Uh, we have also uh, different projects with uh, development partners uh, like uh, AIMS, uh, we have uh, GIZ, uh, uh, we have JICA, we have COICA, uh, and uh, they are also uh, investing a lot in different programs uh, to improve uh, STEM learning. Um, we, for example, we have, uh, we, uh, we, we have this collaboration focusing on the infrastructure, but also on the training programs, and uh, again, uh, on uh, 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 I said the training programs, but we have also uh, on uh, how, how we can also uh, connect, like the hands-on uh, learning, how to connect uh, or apply what is learned in school uh, in the real world. And uh, we have also a lot of uh, partnership with uh, the private sector uh, because it can't work we, without, because for example, if we go into uh, the, the, the field of uh, technology, for example, we are working with this uh, telecommunication because when we talk about internet, um, Arab itself is not providing, uh, it's not, uh, an internet provider, but we have to work closely uh, with the internet providers or telecommunication uh, companies, and this is, again, the private sector. So I think uh, with uh, this uh, ecosystem, uh, uh, STEM uh, learning also can be improved, and also uh, pro uh, without, it's not like the government cannot work here, it's uh, alone but still we need this kind of collaboration, partnership with different stakeholders and key players in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the representative of Director General, for your um, articulative response to our question. Now, Professor Ja presented a number of researches that are going on 
and others have been completed. So I would love to ask uh, Professor Yadaf, how can these researches be used as a tool to promote STEM education? Or you just put them on the shelves and be proud of uh, having written books and articles? Thank you very much, Professor. I think uh, my job uh, is made very easy while uh, Professor Wamoro has presented some things, even some examples of the uh, research topics and research which were conducted by some of the uh, colleagues at the University of Rwanda as well as the students. Uh, saying that, uh, uh, we are emphasizing at the University of Rwanda College of Education uh, to do the research in uh, science and mathematics education particularly in uh, certain areas which are related to what uh, Dr. Bahati has already told that the students are struggling with the STEM uh, subjects, uh, science and mathematics. So we are working on the learning barriers of the uh, students that how they are, what type of learning barriers the students of biology they have or physics students have and what type of methods can be used to address those learning barriers. Uh, particularly let us say the learning barriers related to the concepts of uh, uh, science and mathematics. How can you use, let us say, the multiple representations in the different areas of science and mathematics? Uh, how can you use uh, the concept map diagram, for example, related to the organization of the science and mathematics knowledge? Again, uh, some tools can be used or some methods can be used as I, I already told you, concept map diagrams. And then uh, some of our students are working on the problem solving in sciences, different areas of sciences and mathematics. At the same time, some of our students are working related to the attitudes toward science aid and mathematics expectations of the students in mathematics and science aid, practical skills and hands-on activities as you are already rightly told. They are working what type of difficulties the students have and how can they be addressed. And that thing is helping, for example, when we are developing the curriculum at the uh, University of Rwanda College of Education, we are taking into account uh, those researches that when we are developing our curriculum, some of our colleagues, they are participating in the <coughs> development of curriculum of the uh, RAB, like a competency-based curriculum. Now it is uh, so much improved compared to the old curriculum. And when we are organizing some uh, CPD programs, as Professor Wamoro has already mentioned, then we are using what type of research we are doing, then we are implementing there like project-based learning. It is being implemented in those CPD programs. So what we are doing, we are trying to get the information from the classrooms and trying to find out what type of difficulties the students have and then trying to do research and then after that we are trying to use that research so that again some improvement can be there. So it is a kind of loop we are working on. Now we are thinking that how can we use the artificial intelligence and robotics as Professor Wamoro has mentioned. Some of our students are working use of ICT. Like the some student has prepared uh, the some softwares, how can those be used to teach the hard topics, difficult topics of biology. So that is a kind of innovation what Dr. Buhigiro was talking about. So there are several things which we are doing, use of ICT, use of multimedia, as uh, Professor Wamoro already mentioned about one lady, 
who is a part of this uh, conference, Pasca CC is working, how can we use the multimedia in teaching a sub, uh, difficult subject, as you rightly mentioned that there are some abstract subjects, like quantum mechanics. So we are trying to do research re related to those which uh, some of my colleagues at the panel, they have discussed that there are some difficulties and then finding those difficulties, then we are using some specific methods and a kind of intervention. And after doing the intervention, students are comparing, for example, that uh, one setting which is the, uh, this experimental setting where this intervention is used and some normal setting, uh, traditional method, and they are comparing the results, whether the, this is working and then we are using in the classrooms. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Saadaf, for being to the point now. Madam Faith Mbabas, I understand that Bele focuses on establishing solid foundations at lower primary level, P1 to P5, as well as focusing on enhancing inclusive education approaches. Now, my question is, in your interventions, do you in any way engage these lower primary school learners in some kind of STEM learning? And if so, what kind of approaches do you use? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Faith Mbabazi and I'm the uh, communications and advocacy manager for the Building Learning Foundations program. Um, it's, it's the largest technical assistance component um, of the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office here in Rwanda that has been um, uh, working with the Ministry of Education and uh, Rwanda Basic Education Board since um, early 2000 and, and uh, July 2017. And just like you've, you've said, um, the program is working uh, specifically to improve learning outcomes at um, P1 to P5 in English and mathematics. Um, mathematics as one of the key components of STEM is really key, but we are focusing mainly on the foundation, so the early years. And we all believe here that it starts with the early years. So um, what we are doing is that we are working with um, teachers, uh, teaching English, teaching mathematics, trying to coach, mentor, train them to be able to improve their teaching skills, but also uh, to provide uh, self-directed learning resources that are going to help them to be able to participate in CPD at the school level without taking them out of the school, but rather be able to uh, participate in uh, CPD at their, own, um, at their own time and and within their school. Specifically to the mathematics teachers, um, we've been um, supporting and providing what we call self and peer learning materials. One, um, what we call the printed toolkits, um, accompanied by audio and visual um, uh, materials that mostly help them to be able to um, adapt what they're learning, what they're teaching, and what, we, what they're doing, but to also use an element of technology within the work that they're doing. So uh, every, every teacher is given a printed toolkit, uh, is given audio uh, material, is given um, video material, and a smartphone to be able to um, take videos of their own lessons, they model their own lessons and learn from what uh, their colleagues have been doing. Um, in addition, we have been supporting um, all schools, all government and pu public, public and government aided primary schools in the country, providing teaching and learning materials, both for the teachers and for the learners. So for the learners, we've been providing what we call pupil math mathematics people activity books for every learner, P1 to P5. Accompanied by um, what you would call um, um, teaching and learning materials that we call ECMs, essential classroom learning materials. And these materials are supplied to every school. So what BLF is doing is we're trying to train, mentor and coach teachers to be able to create what we call numeracy corners in every classroom 
for children to be able to manipulate, to be able to access easily um, um, uh, uh, concrete materials, materials that they can be able to link to their, uh, to their, to their daily lives. So um, we are working directly with the teachers, coaching and mentoring them, but also working directly with learners at that very early age to be able to you know, develop the interest and the love for mathematics at that very early age. Something that's very important that we've recently uh, been piloting is uh, uh, we've, we've noticed over the years that girls continue to lag behind in mathematics. Even in the recent Laos data, you will see that girls continue. There's a very big discrepancy in, in STEM and mathematical related sciences. And we've seen that when, when, when girls or boys are not performing at the same level, then there should be some barriers that really need to be addressed at a very early age. So we, we have tried to include gender responsive pedagogy in all the teaching and learning materials that are provided both to the teachers and to the learners but also creating safe spaces for girls in schools by establishing girls clubs in primary schools where we, 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 we are encouraging gender focal teachers to be able to, to spark the interest in girls to take on STEM related subjects. So for example, um, May, 11th, or May 11th is International Day for Women in Mathematics. So the girls within the girls clubs will come together, celebrate, but also award the best performing girls in mathematics. So we are, we are encouraging, we are rewarding, we are recognizing, and we are motivating girls to be able to, pop, to perform better, to learn, to love mathematics. Um, not a very hard subject for the boys, but also a subject that we girls can be able to um, uh, to take on. So um, we are um, working collaboratively with uh, Rwanda Basic Education Board, uh, with, with schools, um, with NESA, um, to be able to, to monitor how, how is this really reflecting into the learning outcomes uh, of children. So that's in brief. Um, it's, it's a very large program, but that's in brief about what the BLS program um, is doing. Thank you so much. You have teased my brains so much so that I may end up coming back to you. You said girls are performing mm -hmm. not at the same level with their brothers. And I'm sure the directors from Ministry of Education would love to hear that. What are the po potential possible causes for that? Um, we know that uh, there's, there's, there are barriers structural barriers, nomadic barriers, cultural barriers that are preventing girls right from an early age to be able to take on some of what they term as the hard subject. So Building Learning Foundations program has done a very, um, uh, uh, a very detailed study that tries to look at the key barriers that are affecting girls, that are preventing girls from one, learning, two, staying in school, but also achieving. And some of those barriers that we have seen over the years is that one, our families, our culture, where we are growing up, has told us that there are some things that are meant for the boys and they're not for the girls. But also the education system, the teachers, we do not have role models, we don't have female role models who are going to stand up and say, yes, we have made it. When, when Professor was um, uh, making his presentation, I, I was very keen to see who are the women um, candidates, you know, taking on these very hard subjects that we think are very hard and can't be done by the women. And I was very impressed to see some of, of, of those women. And actually, I want to make a plea now that we would want these women to come and become role models for the young girls in school. And that's why I think one of the work that we're doing with uh, the UR uh, University uh, of Rwanda College of Education is to try to empower school leaders and try to encourage more women to take on the roles of school leaders because a female head teacher is a very big role model to a young girl who is growing up in a family where they say the girls wash the ditches, the girls do the chores, and the boys go to school and they do the homework. So it's more engraved within our culture uh, but also within the education system that has not been able to em um, embed gender responsive pedagogy 
within uh, our education system. So that is, um, I think, um, what the government of Rwanda, um, what FCDO and other development partners here have been really, really trying to address. How can we eliminate all forms of barriers that are preventing our girls from excelling, from achieving in mathematical sciences? Thank you so much for very articulative responses. And I do believe that's going to make um, uh, Jessica's responses easier than she might have thought. So, AIMS, that is um, Inst African Institute, of, um, Institute for Mathematics and Science. And we are, we are happy to be with Jessica because this is a very instrumental institute as far as STEM is concerned. So I've got a very easy question for you. What are the motivating factors for STEM students? And as per today, how STEM students level of engagement? Thank you. So I can just give a brief introduction to AIMS in case some people don't know it. So AIMS is the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. It's a network of centers of excellence around Africa. So at the moment, we're in five countries, Rwanda, Cameroon, Senegal, Ghana, and South Africa. And AIMS has many different programs within it. And in Rwanda, our main programs are the master's course in mathematical sciences, the teacher training program, which works in 14 districts, and a very large research center that researches in data science, climate change, and something else that I have forgotten. Um, so, so the question, can you remind me the question exactly? Okay. I was saying, what are the motivating factors for STEM students? And what's their level of engagement? Okay, so the motivating factors for STEM students, I think that's, you know, it varies across age groups, whether you're like Faith, you work in primary school, their kids are motivated by fun, by their parents, what their parents are pushing them, what their teachers are pushing them to do, whether they have role models, like Faith said. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Marie Chantel couldn't come from Ruise, but Rwanda has a very strong Rwandan Association for Women in Science and Engineering, and I think they do great work being the role models. Um, and I think that's something, at all levels, the motivating factor can be role models. You see someone like you and you think, hey, I could do that when I grow up. So I think role models is a big one. Obviously your culture, your background, the different people in your life pushing you to do it or not to do it. You know, you could have teachers who are really motivating you, who after you get a test score say, hey, well done, you're really improving. Or you could have teachers that look at your test score and say, hmm, that's not very good. And maybe the student gets demotivated. Um, so I think the the culture around, and that, that's a huge thing that I think many of us are trying to change through different interventions in teachers. Um, I think the role of teachers on a student's development is like, everyone here knows it's huge. Um, so I think influencing the teachers to be more gender responsive, to be more motivational, has a huge effect on the motivating factors. Um, and then I think one of the other motivating factors for all, I guess once kids get a little bit older, is to think about, am I employable? Like if I follow engineering, will I get a good job? Will I be financially secure? Mm -hmm. Like if I become a maths teacher, am I going to have enough money to feed my family? And that's a motivating factor that can drive people away from STEM because they don't realize that they can make money in this area. So one of the things I do in Rwanda is to run the Maths Olympiad program, which is finding the top high school students in mathematics and training them. And so these are students that are like, three of my students have gone to MIT in the last three years. Okay, they're the top students in this country and they are so smart. Like, you cannot believe the talent. But for most of them, I tell them, oh, are you going to study mathematics? They say no. Because they can't make money. They think if they study mathematics, they will become a maths teacher. And for me, if you study mathematics, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Like, when you have a very good foundation in mathematics, whether it's at primary school, whether it's at secondary school, at university, it makes everything else so much more doable in STEM. 
Like when you have your good primary school teacher who really explains how division works, maybe even long division, then you know that for life. If you have a primary school teacher who confuses you, you don't understand long division, at every step, you're going to be confused when it keeps coming back. So realizing that mathematics and STEM can really lead to good jobs, that can really lead to, let's say, a good life. And most, like once kids get to teenage, they realize life can be different depending on your job. So having, I mean, that also comes back to role models. You see Dr. Marie Chantel, you see she's successful. You know, she's a professor at University of Rwanda. She's really made it. And you know that if you study physics and you follow that passion, you can make it too. So I think having that knowledge that STEM is really something that can bring you to good places is important for students. It's a motivating factor. Um, and then the final part was the level of engagement of students. So I work, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question fully. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't think I'm qualified because I only work in a small part of Ames. We work on the Maths Olympiad Maths competition side of things. So we just ran a competition for 36,000 students from S1 to S3. Um, and that's what I know about engagement. And for us, we try to engage them in having fun mathematics that's outside the curriculum. And for that, I know that basically the teacher is the biggest indicator of engagement. If the teacher is willing to put a little bit more time to do some printing, to do some organizing, <coughs> the students can become engaged. But we also know there's some schools, we try and engage them and the teacher is busy. They have other things, which is understandable. Teachers are very busy people. Um, and then the students can't be engaged for us. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much, dear panelists. I guess I wouldn't have to beg for the strong applaud for these panelists for their wonderful responses. Please join me to thank them so much. Thank you so much. And I guess the, the rest I'll return to the owner, Dr. Mike. Thank you so much. Did you just say I'm the owner? I appreciate Prophet, thank you so much for giving me that uh, kind of, uh, of title as well. So please, uh, do you, I hope we take two questions, two, que two burning questions from someone so passionate about this topic. And then uh, Dr. Mack, and then uh, my other colleague, I'll know the name when I get close. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Prophet P. Mack from the University of Rwanda, College of Education. Uh, allow me to thank the, the panelists first for the insightful presentation, specifically on these responses to uh, quality STEM education. Uh, I want my question is building on uh, Dr. Bahati's presentation, uh, Director General of NESA, uh, and it is in line with the, uh, this kind of poor, <coughs> sorry. Poor, poor assess, a kind of poor, when you, when you check the, the level of performance for science, for science students, what he was presenting, we see a kind of uh, poor performance uh, for, stu for students who are doing STEM, probably in comparison with those who are doing other subjects like uh, social sciences, uh, languages, etc. Uh, and uh, I want probably to hear uh, one or two strategies that the NESA and Minedic in general are putting in place uh, to make sure we uplift this kind of uh, poor performance. We know from the, the responses that were given by uh, REB representative, BLF, and uh, EMS, we see a lot of interventions that are coming on board. But can we have like one, two strategies that were put in place or are being put in place by NESA Minedic to make sure we uplift the performance of uh, our student in STEM. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to be answering the questions at the same time, I mean together with the next one. And for those new to this uh, place, NESA is the National Examination and School Inspection Authority. That's uh, the DG out there. Uh, 
Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity, at least to ask your question. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate the, the, the presenters for uh, a very, my name is Christine Jerome Schuma from the University of Dodoma, Tanzania. And I'm also a PhD candidate doing uh, my research in STEM. In fact, I have, uh, uh, of course, had the initiative that in place, especially in Rwanda government, to ensure that uh, students are well engaged and STEM education is promoted. So my question is, I know that uh, you have these psychologists in the education system and special these career counselors, or we call them school counselors. So I want to understand to what extent are these people uh, involved or engaged to ensure that uh, they promote student interest, self-efficacy, and to help them at least develop positive attitude towards this science subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right, as I think we take one more question and then we hand over to the panelists for responses. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Benoit Iradukunda and I'm the country representative for OVO, or Entrepreneurs for Entrepreneurs. Um, I want to thank the panelists for a very nice conversation. I was very excited to hear uh, people advocating for ladies into the STEM fields. And what's more exciting is that the people who are advocating for this are already ladies who are already in the STEM fields. But my question would be, um, uh, you are speaking about uh, encouraging girls to take on um, STEM fields and also to have more role models in the STEM fields. Um, and I uh, want to uh, make sure that it doesn't uh, sound as if it's enforcing an outcome. I was wondering if you have a case scenario where um, you had uh, maybe um, girls looking up to role models in the STEM fields and it increased the number of girls who are taking up STEM fields. Because um, personally, I do not think that um, just having women who are in STEM fields is enough to have girls take on the STEM fields. If I'm speaking from a personal experience, if I know that there's a mathematician who's made it in life, it's not that alone in itself is not enough to convince me to take up the STEM field. So um, if maybe uh, there's like a case scenario where uh, having role models in the STEM fields has worked, that would be very good to reinforce this better. Because uh, right now, the way things are, it sounds as if um, you are sort of trying to enforce an outcome by having women in STEM fields and are making us take up these STEM fields. Do they even really want to take up the STEM fields? Are they interested in STEM? Thank you so much. Yeah, we have one last comment. It's not a question. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you so much for the energy. Uh, also, research suggests that the best answers are gotten from the health break time when you're having a bite. Um, that's that, I just made that one up because we are so caught up with time, unfortunately, so if you don't mind, uh, these gentlemen are going to be with us during the health break. You can always catch up with them and get some great detail. Otherwise, we have some other presentations and like you requested, we have to leave, leave this place at one shop. Sorry for that again. Thank you um, for the time and for the beautiful conversation. I see we have an enabling environment, um, serious support for, for STEM. But I think as we are rethinking holistic education and reshaping education for sustainable development, I think we now need to think about synchronizing our efforts with industry and solving our problems, problems we are facing today, and come up with solutions to our problems so that our meds is not just meds, but it's meds that's working for us um, in energy provision, for example, in easing congestion. Uh, that's one problem I've seen just the short time I've been. There's a lot of um, traffic congestion. How is our meds, how is our STEM um, solving that problem? How can we solve that problem? Um, I've also seen the short time I've been here, the issue of sewage treatment. How can we use our meds to try and improve sewage treatment? How can we use our meds to try and maybe solve some of the health problems we have so that our meds becomes useful to us and do not remain bookish? 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Ndabaga. You may take us through the next five minutes responding to the questions. Brief is good, I'm told. Thank you very much. I think the first question was all about the strategies, and I think that one was directly directed to Dr. Bahati. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Epimak. Uh, I don't know whether I'm in a better position to, to effectively answer your question, but uh, as uh, someone who is part of the Ministry of Education, I'm going to try my best. And I think uh, Reb and uh, uh, Doctor uh, from the Ministry uh, can maybe compliment me. Maybe I will uh, try to say what we are doing from the assessment perspective uh, to make sure that uh, maybe some of the issues that are observed in our schools uh, does, do not uh, prevent our student from maybe performing well in some of assessments. Um, uh, one of the things maybe uh, which is being done currently by the Ministry of Education uh, is trying to uh, make STEM as a priority when it comes to uh, uh, distributing some funds. I, I can maybe here uh, give an example of one of the, uh, the projects uh, uh, priority skills for growth. It's a, it's a, it's a big project. Uh, it's funded by World Bank. Uh, it, it's a project which is looking to how uh, we make sure that uh, uh, the teaching and learning of STEM is improving in our schools by equipping uh, uh, higher education and other institutions with the required materials by training teachers and so on and so on. So, uh, prioritization of STEM uh, in the Ministry of Education is, is one of the, the key strategies. The second one uh, is uh, investing in teacher training, uh, which is uh, uh, another area if you want uh, uh, STEM education to be uh, uh, effective and uh, maybe attain intended goals. Uh, teachers need to be trained and uh, I think the College of Education, as people have been saying, can be uh, an example. Uh, another important thing is uh, uh, making sure that there is a public and private uh, partnership uh, in terms of promoting uh, STEM education. And uh, there are many examples uh, which can uh, really uh, uh, put forward uh, to make sure that uh, uh, STEM education is improved and uh, uh, of course as I said I cannot maybe provide an exhaustive uh, uh, answer to that question. Reb, they are in a better position. They are the ones are putting in place some of the teaching and learning strategies <coughs> but again the Ministry of Education. Let me come back maybe to, to what we are doing in terms of uh, assessment. Uh, as I said before um, uh, STEM, even when we are uh, preparing assessment, national exams, and other types of assessment, sometimes uh, at NESA uh, we struggle. I can give you an example of, of, of one uh, aspect of national exams uh, where students are required to do uh, practical national exams. We know we have students who are doing science combinations in our schools, but we also know that all our schools are not equipped with labs. Mm -hmm. So when we, we used to prepare a national exam, where all those students who are coming from schools without uh, uh, labs, without uh, other required equipment that can allow them to practice science subject, we used to prepare the same practical exam. So recently, we came to realize that it's not fair. It's not really fair to prepare a national exam, a practical science exam, <coughs> which is going to be uh, done by the student coming from the schools who are equipped with science labs and those students who are, are coming from the, the, 
the schools without uh, the required science, science labs or other materials. So we sat down recently and we thought uh, things should not continue uh, like this. And then uh, we are looking to how uh, the science practice uh, activities can be carried out in what we call uh, project-based assessment. Uh, we, 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 we engage students in assessment, and this is something they will be doing well ahead, national exams, and those project-based assessment will be tailored to the types of schools, whether it's a school equipped with required uh, science labs, or whether it's a school where we have uh, just simple science kits or other materials, and we hope even that uh, some student, even teachers, will have opportunity to improvise, even if they don't have uh, uh, this state-of-the-art uh, lab equipment, they can even improvise and use uh, locally available materials. So that's what I can say, Prof, on the question asked by Dr. Epimak. But as I said, my colleagues here uh, may complement and provide some further uh, clarifications. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. If there is any brief addition, please, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will be a little bit brief, because even if we say he's not conversant to, to this, but he's part of the education system, and uh, what I can say, uh, he has already provided the answers, because for this performance we need to have good teachers, that's the first, and this is, uh, this is a requirement from all institutions that are here, the University of Rwanda College of Education, in order to get uh, good performance at the high school, we need to have good teachers, that's first. The second one is to have also good students, Good students means well prepared from primary and also to, to lower secondary so that uh, uh, while they are taking STEM subjects, it is easier for them to impart those knowledge. And again, as he mentioned again, we need to have those uh, equipment. We need to have these uh, teaching learning materials so that all these putting together, we can have the good performance. And again, also we, we need to have those pedagogical skills and gender balanced uh, uh, pedagogy to make sure that all learners, uh, boys and girls, are getting the same. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess that whisper from Mike, you can easily guess what it was about. In other words, he was telling me what you know. So, perhaps for the last, let us a very, very brief comment on the issue of um, career guidance in schools, what he, she called in, uh, counselors, for I'm terming it, career guidance, probably Faith can briefly, if you have anything, you know how career guidance practiced in schools to motivate these young people towards the STEM. Um. Actually, I wanted to, to, to send that question over to Reb because they have uh, um, the, the TDM and CGC, Teacher Development uh, Management and Career Guidance and Counseling, um, a department which is working um, with, with teachers, but also working with schools and, 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 and learners to be able to choose their careers at, 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 at a very early age. Maybe I can first hand over to Reb and then I can... Uh, I can, I can so you share your problem. two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> She's left with the one. Please, you are welcome, madam. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, but I think she already answered that because, yes, there That's is good. a department already that is working on a career, um, who is, uh, which is uh, focusing on career guidance and uh, counseling and uh, uh, there is uh, this system where uh, students uh, can go and then find some questions, answering them, then it guides them to know uh, what uh, the field in where they belong, like where they can continue their studies. And uh, I think this is... Uh, Thank you very much, schools, madam. I think and in uh, schools also they do have these uh, uh, counselors. And then uh, we are also trying to see how we can... Uh, change the, the, the structure of the schools to include 
uh, that person in every school who can help students and orient them when they're taking their further studies. Thank you so much. The last two, one was just a comment, another one was about the role models, which faith you really elaborated on it. But as Mike put it correctly, during the health break, you can go closer to her and have more insights on the question of role models. Thank you so much. Mike, for the again, yours. Thank you, Prof. Dora, please. Uh, Thank you, panelists. Uh, Dr. Dor is going to give you uh, extra instructions. Um, thank, thank you, uh, the moderator, uh, Professor Ndavaga, and to the panelists for your insightful presentations and remarks on STEM education. Now, actually, I'm going to invite the principal of the College of Education to give a token of gratitude to the panelists, the moderator, and the keynote speaker. Um, the Aloysian principal, team. Sorry? The principal of the College of Education, you're welcome here. Uh, to give a token of thanks to the, um, yeah, to the panelists, the moderator, and um, the keynote speaker. Uh, Professor Ja Wamaro, you can come on board. A round of applause, please, if you appreciate what these guys did. Thank you. And we're going to have a group photo before you take your seats, uh, the cameraman. Stem people don't smell, right? They do. OK. They smell mathematically. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, for so being so generous. You may be invited to your seats. Okay, the next seats. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, you may see we have a fully packed day. Uh, part of the activities that are remaining, for those of you who don't have the agenda, is that you're going to a, to a health break. And after the health break, we have the different people who are moderating panel sessions. I mean, uh, sessions, the, the, the discussions down there. The people presenting, please try to use good time so that by one, we are here, the vice chancellor is going to be here for the closure of this event. So that implies that you do the health break within uh, 20 minutes, please. Uh, Dr. BTT, you're going to at least make sure that we use the 20 minutes effectively so that people transition to their presentations. Are we good? Those of you who have mission orders, you may please take them to the back stage so that they stamp them. Those of you who paid and you want your receipts, there is again a lady at the back who is going to give you that proof of payment. You may need it for some reasons. And if there is any announcement you want to make somewhere, you'll be reaching out to us and we give you time. There's a lot of things to capture today. Again, I'm reminded, yesterday we submitted the form that most, some of you wanted to visit the genocide memorial. 
and there is a, a form that you fill so that they know how many people are there so that they are able to take you around. So please fill the form if you want to. We already have a number, but we want to be sure that uh, we plan logistically transportation. So fill the form so that we're able to see how many are in and how many may not be going. Thank you so much again. We have 20 minutes for health break and five minutes are already gone. SDSN. I'm reminded that the SDSN group is going to come back here after the health break.
Yeah, whatever, whatever. Thanks so much. Could we ask uh, participants to come to the forefront, please? We need to see your faces just in front of us. Yes, uh, thank you also, Mama Lambert, being with us uh, also for this session. Highly appreciate it. And the colleagues from Solace, thank you so much. Take a seat for the, the very last session of SDSN, Sustainable Development Solution Networks, Grand Lac, Great Lakes, and, uh, and cooperation with SDSN Belgium. And you can see it because uh, some of us definitely come from, from that country. And having the same sense of love affair with Rwanda. Yeah. And the leadership of Rwanda dealing with... Uh, with Africa to court, but also with SDSN as the key role player in um, not just the African Union, but also uh, in SDSN. It's good, it's good to be here and to have you here. We uh, made yesterday a quite important decision, um, last days actually, that um, SDSN Grand Lac, Great Lakes, and SDSN Africa, and, and SDSN Belgium are undertaking the next steps in the process of researching, reflecting, and debating on implementations of uh, the SDGs. And the interconnectivity of SDG 4 with other SDGs, as we, we had the chance to have the report from our friend and colleague on um, uh, interlinks between SDG 4 and most other SDGs uh, two days ago in, in the panel chaired by, by Jan, Jan Beine. So we, we uh, uh, will have this follow-up conference in Congo Brazzaville 2024 and uh, again an SDSN meeting in Kigali 2025. More details will come uh, next month from the desk of SDSN uh, Great Lakes in SDSN Africa. Well, yesterday we had in the last session, some of you were there, a very fascinating talk on, on research and on research culture in education and the role of universities, higher education institutions. And I provoked a little bit the audience on the, the limits and the challenges of the university as a entrepreneurial entity, the entrepreneurial activities and dimensions of the university, the opening a huge debate on, uh, on, on enterprises uh, and institutions with social economic activities and education, high education, education in all, at all levels. It's, it's a, a rather modern story because quite a long time there, wasn't, there were hardly links between the education sector and the economic um, gremia of, of a society. And that was a failure. Because they are partners, definitely, in the public interest, in the interest of and the enterprises, the firms, and also education. Education institutions uh, should be more open for the entrepreneurial uh, dimensions and the involvement of, of leading um, stakeholders like businessmen, um, like those persons with leadership in, in the economy of a country and of the region, it's a win-win. But it's not just an opportunity, it's definitely indispensable. It's, it's a need. 
And SDGs are also focusing on this partnership between uh, enterprises and the education sector. We could open now a whole uh, theoretical um, analysis on, on what are the benefits and what are the dangers, what are the risks. Um, but we, we will keep it quite, quite, um, quite concrete and to some extent pragmatic. So we have good examples, good practices, and that's all about SDSN, because SDSN is just that platform of N academics, researchers, and stakeholders in, in uh, the economy, uh, and uh, civil society, and social entrepreneurs. Um, that, that's about SDSN. So an SDG should, should take that discourse very seriously into account, more than, than before. For that, we, we invited the leading, uh, leading thinker, uh, Dr. Jan, Jan Bijn, who, um, who took already the floor two days ago. You probably uh, attended that meeting, that uh, session of SDSN. He, he researched quite extensively on those issues, and he invited also the panel members. Uh, he will in introduce um, those three wonderful uh, profiles just uh, at the end of his, of his introduction. Dr. Bene, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor De Groof. And uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome back. Uh, I'll keep it very short, actually, this introduction, because I'm indeed very happy that we have a wonderful panel with bright and young people working in and around Rwanda, around uh, the SDGs as well. Uh, and I will introduce them very, very shortly uh, to you. Um, this panel builds also a little bit further on the day before yesterday, when we already had a panel on inclusive and equitable education and how to break down the walls. Now, breaking down the walls, if we can also hear it from that session, we need all kinds of stakeholders working together, as Professor De Gove also mentioned it now. And that means we need academia, we need government, but we also definitely need entrepreneurs. We need the profit and the non-profit sector working together uh, on, on these SDGs. And um, as a volunteer at OVO, Entrepreneurs for Entrepreneurs, I will uh, gladly give you an introduction, a short introduction on what is OVO and what are they doing uh, here in Rwanda. Um, and to start, um, I actually uh, combine my academic knowledge with a lot of practical experience. And I was very happy to notice there is an entrepreneurial mindset in Kigali, in Rwanda. There is a big startup scene and we have representative here as well. Uh, you have Impact Hub Kigali, who was here the day before yesterday. You have uh, Westerwelle Foundation, you have Norskin. You have so many entities here only in Kigali working on uh, the SDGs, uh, on different dimensions, uh, brilliant entrepreneurs. So that's, I think, um, amazing for a country like, like Rwanda. Um, and I really believe in the combination between the practical experience on the field and academics doing the research and how we can combine these two might be also a topic for discussion uh, today. So um, that said, a very short introduction in what is OVO and what are they doing? Well, actually, there is a spectacular growth uh, in, in Africa, uh, much faster than employment growth. So OVO is operating in different countries in Africa, um, encouraging entrepreneurship. That's the main idea, to provide opportunities for everyone in their own region. They're also looking at investing in sustainable entrepreneurship in, in Africa. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, one of uh, these entrepreneurs can also talk about that, uh, how OVO is helping them in new investments um, when it comes to that. Actually, OVO sees local entrepreneurship as an engine an engine for increasing opportunities. Um, they select, coach, finance, and monitor. They monitor African businesses and projects to help them achieve their goals. And it's only not by helping them on their business plan, but it's also about looking at 
um, topics such as sales, marketing, transport, so many different things that uh, a startup also needs. And they actively build an international network of partners, experts and organizations that share the same goal, looking for sustainable entrepreneurship. They create impact on three levels. Donations is one. Um, affordable loans, helping the startups and scale-ups uh, grow with social loans. That's uh, the focus on Uganda, Rwanda, Senegal and Benin. And they uh, provide expertise with a lot of volunteers uh, around the world, uh, going for coaching, mentoring and knowledge exchange. And they grow, overgrow as an independent network organization, really with that entrepreneurial mindset. Working together with foundations, working together with non-governmental organizations, sponsored educational institutions in Belgium and in Africa, um, with partners organizations like you see here, uh, for example, Enabel, the Development Corporation of Belgium, public authorities and, uh, and volunteers. So this is becoming a big network of a lot of stakeholders working together on uh, sustainable entrepreneurship. Four strengths is what they uh, push forward, sustainable economic projects with social impact, a very extensive network of like-minded people going for the same goal and mindset, a professional team supported by experienced volunteers and access to expertise to stimulate that creativity and knowledge transfer. So that was actually a very short introduction in what OVO is doing. And the main idea of OVO also in the different programs that um, our panelists were involved with is not about educating on sustainability, but it's about educating for sustainability. And that's a big difference. Educating for sustainability, sustainable development means including key sustainable development issues into teaching and learning. For example, climate change, for example, poverty reduction, sustainable consumption, etc. All these different themes, 17 goals, 169 targets. How can you cope with that as an entrepreneur here? How can you foster impact on different SDGs? So educating for uh, sustainable development is, is central also for OVO. And they're looking at how can we create and develop an entrepreneurial and sustainable mindset. With that, we mean also a sustainable critical mindset. How can you create a focus on what you do? And at, this, at the moment, you already know about the sustainable development goals. The day before yesterday, I talked about the good life goals or the sustainable lifestyle goals. But another initiative on the side, and it's becoming more and more in the forefront, it's called the inner development goals. What is important for you as an individual to create that entrepreneurial and sustainable mindset? And they put forward five ideas. Being, the relationship to self, thinking, cognitive skills, relating, caring for others and the world, collaborating, social skills, and acting, enabling change. Being, thinking, relating, collaborating, acting. These five inner development goals are also looked at in different programs of OVO to create that entrepreneurial and sustainable mindset. And I'm not going to detail all the programs that OVO is doing uh, around different countries, but I just put forward a few of them here. Um, Afri Farmers Market, which you will hear, hear more uh, about that, providing a stable market to farmers and fresh, affordable produce to consumers. You have uh, Punda, which is offering preventive underhousing services with an emphasis on sustainable products for local construction market. 
Um, you have Margo Farms and they, they plan constructions of insect-based protein production, etc, etc, etc. Different kind of entrepreneurs, different kind of companies working on the same idea, sustainable development from different angles. And they were coached, they were trained and they train each other, they push each other towards how can we create that entrepreneurial and sustainable mindset. Three ways of learning that is over also put in the forefront. And actually, these are three uh, ways that we also looked at uh, the first day of the conference. And one of them is value-based learning. OVO is wanting to create that harmonious learning environment. And with that word, I mean integrating the positive human values, such as respect, such as courage, love, peace, compassion, equality, honesty, patience, etc. Learners are also encouraged to develop an ethical vocabulary. And learners are providing the time and space to develop the self-reflective practices. For example, what does equality mean to me and to what I'm doing? What does trust mean? What does courage mean? So this is what we call value-based learning. And a question for the panel I also like to raise what are other essential elements to create that harmonious learning environment, to grow as an entrepreneur? Second is project-based learning. And this is what OVO is doing a lot. Here you see a classical image of a design thinking process. You probably saw that before. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, tests. How can you create your organization, your company, by defining ideas, prototyping, testing, empathize again, etc. Really from a design thinking process. This is what OVO is doing also in a lot of boost camps uh, year round with different entrepreneurs. Another way to see it is, and I kind of like this one, it's linked to the design thinking process, but it's more about see, engage and act. Identify your equity commitment. What do you want to do? What kind of impact do you want to have? Next, engage. Better understanding the complexity of the challenge. Remind me to day one about the complexity of the environment where you are in. And it will be different in Kigali, in Kayonza, in different districts in Rwanda. Acting, designing and trying potential solutions. Sometimes you fail. That's also something we heard from uh, the panelists of the African Leadership University. It's important to learn from failures. So when it comes to project-based learning, this is a very interesting tool that OVO is also using to learn new things. Another one, the last one, is on backward design, where you actually look backward to the whole thing. You ask first the question, which learnings activities will lead students to the desired results? Then you check, how do I check they have learned? And what is the intended end of the learning process? This is a very interesting tool OVO is also sometimes using in their projects. And then maybe this is a, an example of what happened only two, three weeks ago where there is a new project launched on circular construction. And different entrepreneurs from all around Rwanda were uh, given the opportunity to meet each other, to learn from each other in a boost camp, working on different theories, different models to boost their company. And this is a uh, collaboration between different partners um, you have Enabel, the Belgium Federal Development Agency. You have Vito Energyville, uh, the Flemish Institute for Technology. Um, and you had OVO with different um, collaborations within Rwanda, also the University of Rwanda itself. And they also look at project-based learning by looking at design thinking processes to boost your um, learning, to boost your company. 
So maybe that's the next question for the panel. What are some essential elements when applying project-based learning? What did you learn? What was helpful? What was not helpful? And then the last one, we also talked about that already in the first day, integrated learning, breaking through the confines of subject-specific learning. I was grateful to see how different companies within the OVO network are growing. And once in a while, they have different challenges. And every company has some barriers that they need to tackle. And by integrated learning, by looking at different opportunities to boost sales, marketing, learning new perspectives, um, scale up, etc., cetera, um, we saw magnificent improvements by a lot of companies. So integrated learning is important. And therefore, I just show you this. This is a circular economy business model canvas, which was used also in the latest boost camp where we challenged also companies to look at different angles, such as key activities, the partners, the mission you have, um, the users, the context, the distribution, et cetera, et cetera, by looking at different angles of the whole business. And I'd like to end with some final reflections and maybe also some questions to start this panel. And I'll be happy to have a seat here to just have a, an open dialogue about these things. And two questions besides of the, uh, the other ones that I raised during uh, this short introduction is, in which ways do you believe learners are able to engage in learning? Because you have so many learning opportunities here and there, but how can you keep learners engaged? That's maybe a one question I have. And another one, which actually links to the title of the conference, Rethinking Holistic Education for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. You're all brilliant in innovation and technology and embracing that. And the question then for you is, how can innovation and technology boost learning, but also what are the challenges or maybe the downsides of using innovation and technology? So I'll keep it like that. Um, if you want to know more about OVO and what they are doing, you can reach out to me, but also to Benoit Iradukunda. He's a representative of OVO here in Kigali. And that actually leads me to introducing Benoit. Um, he's a Pan-African youth advocate currently based in Rwanda, where he serves as the country representative of OVO, Entrepreneurs for Entrepreneurs. And um, actually prior to joining OVO, he worked as a programs coordinator at the Young Ancestors Foundation, which is a platform that he co-founded, which seeks to empower young people through provision of the 21st century skills and create partnerships to establish employment opportunities for youth across the African continent. So this is Benoit. Um, then we have um, Norman. Norman Mugisha is the founder and CEO of Afri Farmers Market. One example I presented to you, but I'm sure Norman can uh, um, go on, on on that and what they are doing. It's actually a social enterprise that leverages technology to support rural smallholder farmers to access stable markets for their agricultural produce. And then last but not least, we have Vivens, um, is the founder and CEO of Umurava. He can also talk about that uh, during his introduction. Uh, but Vivens, um, yeah, you hold a bachelor's degree in business management from Southern New Hampshire University uh, through Kepler. Uh, you also undertook various extensive training programs in the field of data analysis and product management. Thank you all for joining this panel. Uh, and I'd like to start with the last question I raised on the link with the title of this conference. How do you embrace innovation and technology and is it a boost for your learning processes, for your company, or is it also sometimes a barrier? And how do you cope with that? 
Maybe first question to you, uh, Benoit, and I will join the panel uh, and also give then the floor to Professor uh, De Groof for further moderation. And it would be lovely also to have you on board. If you have any questions for the panel, you can already think about it, and then we can pass on the mic. Yes. Uh, yeah, start. yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ian, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I will start with the first question about um, technology and how it can, um, in technology and innovation and how it can uh, improve or affect uh, business generally. Uh, so technology is, uh, mostly means that the knowledge that you need to use in day-to-day -day life, especially as an entrepreneur or as a learner, is just a click away. That in itself can be a challenge, but it can also be an opportunity. It can be an opportunity in a sense that it's never been easier to access knowledge. Some, a long time ago, you would need to go to a library or go to a school to acquire a certain type of knowledge. Today, we have tons of MOOCs or like online courses that you can take and acquire the knowledge you need to apply in your business or day-to-day -day life in a very short amount of time. Today, you can leverage ChatGPT for those of you who have heard about it. I was recently following a conversation uh, from RDB. They were trying to learn ways on how they can leverage on ChatGPT to improve business. It's a challenge for schools, but it's an opportunity for businesses. It's a challenge for schools because it means a student can log into ChatGPT and get an essay written in a matter of seconds. But it's an opportunity on the other side of the aisle because businesses can leverage that to save time. You don't have to hire someone um, who is going to be in charge of your communications when you can easily have a subscribe on ChatGPT and then have all the work done so fast. So I would say um, when it comes to technology and innovation, it has a downside, but every um, threat or every uh, constraint comes with an opportunity. That, uh, th that constraint of, um, can also be turned into an opportunity in the sense that we can use technology to save time and um, you know, improve the, way, the ways we work. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I think for me, technology in the work I do means a lot. Um, I grew up in a village where I used to see, even including my parents, my neighbors, carrying a fresh basket of fresh produce going to the market, looking for somebody to buy. And when I got an opportunity to like study and live like in the US and China, I would see people, everything they wanted just by a click on the phone. So my, my concern was how can I come back in my home country, on my continent, to leverage that power of technology as we ensure sustainability. But the challenge maybe would be adaptation. How do we explain people how technology is very, very important, even the deep rural farmer who is in deep, deep area in the village. So right now, like while we started, how imp impactful it is. Now with our technology, a farmer can just sell his or her produce on the farm without moving any kilometer, without carrying a basket looking for somebody. Or sometimes you find like their moms having given their kids at the back and a full of basket of more than 20 kilo kilograms looking, walking like more than 10 kilometers to reach the nearest market. So how do we leverage technology in that pers perspective? That, that remember the, the produce she's carrying on her, her head going to the market contributes 80% of her household income. Imagine she has one hectare full of tomatoes. She cannot carry all that how many tons in that one in, 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 in that in that in that piece of land that harvest that is ready? What is going to happen to that fresh harvest? Definitely, like the reports have been shown by far and different more than like on sub-Saharan Africa, more farmers lose up to forty percent of the harvest on the farm due to post-harvest losses. How do we leverage technology? The question is to ensure that that food does not waste, and if it is wasted, it contributes poverty in those rural communities and food insecurity even not only in Rwanda, but also across the continent. But what is amazing is if you come here in the city, like we are seated here after this session, I'm sure there is will be a delicious lunch. How do you access people who are preparing that lunch for us who are here, or people who are coming, or hotels, restaurants, even households, how living in the city, disconnected away, way of, far away from those farmers, how do they access that fresh produce on their doorstep? It could save time. So at the free farmers market, that's what we're actually trying to do. And 
how do we leverage the power of technology to help these rural communities, you know, improve in terms of uh, the household income, uh, also you know, ensuring food security and ensuring that people in the cities can access that fresh produce at affordable and more convenient. So I do believe that there are challenges, of course, definitely, like the farmers when we started, my idea, initial idea was just to create a platform that can, farmers can interact directly with the consumers. But it's a challenge. Most of the farmers we work with, they have these small phones. They don't have access to internet. Some of them, they even have walk some distance to charge. He charges day to day, and by the time he goes back to bring it to reach home, the, the charge, which was the battery, which was 100%, to reach home within 60% charged. So, you know, like how do we also enable that and explain and ensure that facilitate that even internet is much cheaper, even accessing those smartphones are cheaper. We're talking about the STEM, we're talking about graduates, and all. how do we have made our technology for students that are graduating from our universities? How can they solve those challenges? It's not a matter of talking about it, but how do we enable students who are graduating, supporting like organization like OVO, how do we have those entrepreneurial mindset within starting from the, from the primary to the secondary and solving not whatever you are learning, how do you implement it to solve the challenges that are pressing our communities and our continent? Thank you so much. It's uh, so, it's, can I ask? Mike, it's so inspiring to listen to enthusiastic models, good practices. Thank you so much for your wonderful uh, demonstration of, on how, how to in, be involved and how, how to involve others. Um, and, and yesterday I raised a quite critical comment uh, mentioning that um, universities are not that innovative at all from many perspectives. I even uh, mentioned that they are the most conservative institutions since the Middle Age. There is progress made since, uh, since some decades, but still we can learn enormously from best practices from your side. And you, you are, in, in some, some perspective, even more innovative, more powerful than those big bureaucracies. And I was the governing commissioner for universities, so I, I, can, I can show that, yes, they have to, to be stimulated by real entrepreneurs, by those who made it. So please, could you comment on the questions of Jan? Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, so I'm with events, uh, as you said, and I'm from Umurava. First of all, like, the whole topic here resonates with what we do. To give you the context, when you come across around, you will find more young people, even graduates from our universities struggling to find jobs outside here. And then when you move out again, you find that the companies and organizations are struggling to find the right workforce for their available jobs and, 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 and even projects. And then from combining those two problems, we came up with a solution to build just a marketplace platform where now it's easier for companies and organizations to get the workforce for their jobs and projects and we are trying to make sure that in 48 hours, companies which want workforce can get them from us. And you understand that we do a lot of work in terms of talent assessment, talent vetting process, and talent acquisition processes to make sure that we get quality workforce and we do a lot of trainings. And the, so far, the model is working. Since June 2021 up to now as we speak, we matched more than 400 people with jobs and projects in the companies and organizations which are based here and also we are enabling some companies in Europe and America to hire remote uh, Rwandan uh, workforce and so far you understand that first of all technology and innovation is it, the core heart of the business we are working on and then second typically to the question on our side, as the entrepreneurs who are trying to embrace technology and innovation to learn so that we can avoid the impactful either socially and economically models, we have been taking the programs which are based in the US, other parts of the country in Africa, Europe, we were over as well. It was a purely virtual training programs for our company to learn either financial modeling, building digital business models, marketing, communication, each and everything. So now technology made it easier for someone. I have seen you demonstrating uh, Stanford 
concept for building uh, something and uh, I remember yesterday they were recommending me to take a part of their program again virtually as well. So then you find that now the technology is wide for some guys who are sitting here. I see many young people here. We are always on YouTube, we are always on Twitter, TikTok, each and everything. Now these platforms are becoming the free universities. The experts are there to share the insights, to share how the things are being done for free. On our side, we are normally focusing on the jobs which are in the digital space. It's uh, technology, it's uh, digital media and uh, communication and research and data. These are the things that purely the guys are running themselves and then we find them after six months, they are ready to get the analysis job, software development job, graphic design job. So now the technology is open and the great thing for our country, the investor wrote in interconnectivity and even infrastructure. Now it's a call to action to more young people to reach out to them to show them this is where the opportunities are, let us work together so that we can uh, reach them so but you understand that first technology the core for our business and how it helped us to build our company thanks a lot wow thank you Mike Lee. Mike Lee. thank you also for for this uh, clear demonstration of uh, enthusiasm and, and professional involvement in your initiative may i raise a little bit a critical critical question for three of you perhaps uh, all, all four of you um, Jan, Dr. Benner used some formats, quite, quite helpful, quite inspiring. May I refer to one of the formats I'm using in my lessons on human rights, my lectures on human rights. Let me use just two examples. Education and health as main basic human rights, and we debated that large yesterday afternoon on the interlinks between health and education as most valuable and most crucial human rights for SDGs and for the development. And I'm using the four A's, what's accepted now by the human rights, uh, let's say, um, frameworks uh, internationally. First, availability. And remember the four A's, availability of health services, of education services. Accessibility adaptability and acceptability. There's an old library written on, on those four, four A's. I'm adding in my, my reports, I'm adding four other A's, namely awareness, advocacy, accountability, and uh, adequacy. And I should add the fifth name, namely autonomy. But uh, let us use to the more classic. Availability, accessibility, adaptability and acceptability. What about availability, accessibility, and all those, those A's from technology and from science in, the, in, in, in your gremia, in, in, in enterprises, in, in young initiatives, um, dealing with social engineering, with uh, enterprises to cool? Could you have a short, short reflection and how, how to make it, what is the role of public authorities? What is the role of civil society? and of, of, uh, of other enterprises, and to make it also among all of you, um, among young entrepreneurs, uh, all those technology available uh, via the good, good practices. Could we, could we go from there to there? Yes, please. Uh, thanks a lot for the great question. And to the fact, most of the times, these educational resources which are highly, highly needed, especially get the STEM they have been talking about, they tend to be expensive. It means that on affordability, it tends to become a big problem. Like on our core business, we are like, if as of now, we have 250 plus jobs where we missed people who can fit for. You, came to ask, you come to ask your question is that, okay, if we launch a training program for six months, maybe in a data analysis, it's going maybe to cost 1,000 USD per student. And these potential students who want these jobs, who are capable to get these skills, they are going probably not to access the money. Now you throw back the question, who else can do it? So that's why now we come and you start to look at what government is doing and, do and having. And it's even in our plan to go to University of Rwanda 
so that they have a public infrastructure. If they have a public infrastructure on our ability, we can't build the same infrastructure like them. However, we can leverage on that affordability of physical infrastructure they have. And then from there, probably we partner with right organizations, even banks, and we launch a study now pay later program to make sure that now, in terms of the integration, I will bring a financial institution I bring public infrastructure and I will bring my innovation as well and get the space. And what I'm talking about here now, we have some conversation with some organizations here which are big and able to fund that. So you, you, you see that it's more of now how do we integrate and how do we really have a disintegration in methodology to make sure that what is this stakeholder doing? What about this one? What can I bring in the middle and then we co-venture to come up with great results? And then you find that, again, most of the times, when it comes to accessibility in Africa, you will find that now we have schools everywhere. But now the question will come to question about the quality of the graduates who are going to move from there. Again, for me, maybe as a problem as well, I will not blame anyone. However, I need to make sure that I quickly do deep analysis. Is this something I can handle myself? And then you find that most of the times, it's all about to ensure the integrated learning methodology he has mentioned to make sure that you leverage on what is available and you add value addition to make it uh, efficient. So that's what I can comment about accessibility and affordability and how we can always really co-venture and join hands to come up with uh, great uh, solutions which can impact our community, social and economically, which is health and as well as also education, as you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, Mike? OK. Yeah, thank you so much for great question. Thank you, Vivens, for the great uh, input. So I, I, I want to say something. I, what, with my experience, I wish, like on the African continent, the majority, and me inclusive, we wish that things were easier instead of wishing that we are better to deal with those things. So if you look at the challenges that we're facing, if there's climate change, we think we could do much about it. The only thing is to adapt. How do we adapt? How do we even bring skills that are, are usable and affordable to deal with the, with the challenge we're facing? And the reality is, if you're graduating from the university, the reality is, is the reality is the marketplace. If we talked about you are launching and they didn't get the right, um, uh, right skills, so the important, the important is how do we have the right skills? How do we transmit those right skills for people to adapt and even uh, you know, get affordability of the technology that we are bringing? So the most important thing is which skills are we giving the young people to put in the hands-on experience? Really to be ready for the marketplace. Because the marketplace is there and the solutions are going, they can come and a company comes here and they are looking for, you find like majority of the people they even getting uh, importing employment, like employees coming to work from here. Maybe we don't have the right people. So how do we give the right skills to the marketplace? The marketplace doesn't pay you because of the hours you are working for, but it pays you because of the value you're bringing to the company or you're bringing to the marketplace. So talking about for us, like our solution, um, like, uh, like I, I'm, I'm very grateful for the government of Rwanda. Like right now, actually, I've spent the whole week, even my, my team is in, uh, been in up to five, five districts trying to teach uh, farmers on how to use easily to use our technology. So for us, as the vision bears who are looking to expand the entire sub-Saharan Africa, how do we make it much cheaper and affordable for everyone? We realize that they don't have even smartphones. Why would I develop an app for a farmer who doesn't have a smartphone, who doesn't have even uh, you know, uh, internet to buy, who can't access? So we use the small USSD code where he can just, with his small phone, but he can inform us about the progress of his farm and how we can pick that farm and how we can take that farm to the nearest market. So the most very, very important thing is, as us as we're thinking, we should think in a holistic way, mm -hmm. not just thinking, oh, they may have something that is, no, no, no. But the reason people are going to come and use my service, it's because it is solving their problems. So how do I make whatever I'm developing in terms of technology to solve someone's problem, not causing more problems? Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try to connect uh, education and technology. Um, 
those two can go hand in hand. And in the era where we're living, technology is a very important component, whether you are going at school or whether you are at home just living your normal life. And when I look at um, education and technology in Rwanda, I would say to some level, uh, technology is accessible and it's available, but it's not being used. When I look at the school I went to, in my year, that was in 2017, we, uh, my, in, almost my entire promotion got free laptops from Positivo. We had those laptops for our entire A-level, which is like three years, and we, had, we could never use them. A teacher would walk into class and they would be like, no, you cannot use your laptop. I'm like, why am I taking notes when, I can easily, when you can easily give me a soft copy of those notes, you already have it. Why can't, you use, why can't I use that soft copy of the notes so that we use the time we have instead of write, rewriting the notes on book, we use that time maybe to go through the notes. He's like, no, 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 you have to rewrite the notes. I don't care whether you have a laptop or not. So at the end of, the, at the end of your learning period, you have access to technology, it's available, but at the end of your learning period, you can only, you've only watched enough movies. You've not used the technology at all. So I would add another, co another component to that, allow me to add it, called accountability. How are we, because the government has a very nice structure in place promoting technology in education, but are we holding the teachers and the head uh, school, um, head teachers accountable to make sure that even the technology which is available in some places is being utilized? Because in most instances, instances, it's not utilized at all. And this is a very big hindrance because it, it, it will have a ripple effect. Uh, like we've been talked about, they advertise jobs and no one, no one applies. You will be shocked at how many schools you can go to in Kigali. You ask students who are graduating, maybe senior six, how many of them have emails? You will be shocked to find that in 100 students, only 20 of them have it. I went to a particular university in Kigali. I'm not gonna mention the name for confidentiality. I was with the LinkedIn team and we were trying to see how many people are using LinkedIn. That was in 2018. In 300 students which, are, which were present at that time, only 50 of them had LinkedIn profiles, and that is a university. In other universities, LinkedIn is an illusion. They don't even know what it is. Why? But these are things they're supposed to have learned a long time ago. They had access technology. It was available. But the people who are supposed to uh, teach them how to use these tools maybe were not held accountable enough to, so that they can put that technology to use. But I would say, uh, it's available and accessible, maybe not everywhere, but even where it's available and accessible, uh, people, the people who are in charge are not being held accountable to make sure that it's being used. And if it, was, if it's, if it were to be used, it would have a very uh, huge impact. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, can I have a mic? Yeah, yeah um, thank you so much. Highly relevant. Um, Jan, do you want to raise uh, an, an issue for a short third round before going to the audience? Yeah, that might be uh, interesting. I just want to quickly comment on, on, on what I heard. And, and actually, I like, Norman, what you mentioned about adaptation. And Benoit, you also referred to it. Sometimes we have access, but we don't know how to adapt. And actually, when I arrived in Rwanda a year and a half ago, I was very surprised about easy innovations. And I'm just taking one example, Momo. Everyone knows Momo. And <laughs> I'm coming from Belgium. And for me, it was very innovative because you can actually, people who don't have a bank account everywhere around Rwanda, uh, even from the smaller villages, they can use Momo to pay. They can use Momo on there. You don't even need a smartphone for that. And that's a very good innovation to, to create that accessibility and affordability. You can create an, a more inclusive society because you don't push people out. And my and that's not only in Rwanda. Uh, I see that in Belgium, I see that in India, I see that in Rwanda. My fear is how can we make sure that we don't create more inequality related to education because of technology, because of accessibility, because of affordability, because of so many things. Uh, how can we make sure we close that gap between people who are not um, 
who don't have the access or the affordability or the knowledge to adapt to mitigate on, on those issues. Because let's be honest, we are very fortunate to be here in Kigali in this conference. But I met a lot of people around Rwanda and around the world who don't have that accessibility. I don't know if maybe that's a question for, for all of us, but also for you as, as young entrepreneurs, how can we make sure we, we, we don't widen that inequality gap, but we create a society where everyone have access. And I'm just referring to the baseline of the SDGs. It's about transforming our world. How can we transform that in a way that people have access and affordability, uh, not only about technology and innovation, but just related to education? question indeed and it, it reminds us that research technology um, financed or co-financed by public public funds should be at at the service of all of us and should not be monopolized by by some of the society but by, by some of the enterprises what is unfortunately uh, quite often the case in, in in the north okay short short uh, round on on the question of Jan Yes, please. So um, I think on his question, I think I have a bright answer for you. Uh, it's because I think uh, doing like the, the, the business uh, uh, we are building now, it's not more of uh, we want many money. So because when you look at the mission, uh, for me, I didn't talk about my background. Many people confuse me. They think that I'm a Kigari boy because of uh, maybe my last job or what I'm working on. But I'm from a rural area. But I got an opportunity to be in a US-based university. And for me, I was accessing a lot of opportunities. But I didn't get that supplies, by the way, at most. My question was, by the way, I know many young people who were my both competitors in high school back, but they're struggling, right? So then there was now a call to make sure that, okay, how do we now bridge the gap? Digital economy opportunities, jobs, services, they are available to the people in the cities, it's known. So, and what can we do for rural-based people to access those opportunities? That's why uh, already maybe I have to mention this. Our strategy to go massively in terms of uh, upskilling and training we wanted to center our programs in the secondary cities, in Otikigari, to make sure that we are bringing inclusive in available opportunities. When you go and they ask software developers in Ikigari, they are mostly the guys from this city. Why there are no many guys in mathematics and science back in high school who can do magic things when they access the opportunities? So you understand, for me, it's, a, it's, it, it's like a core to me to make sure that we need to decentralize whatever possible. We move from city as well to, to rural areas as long as the resources are, are coming. And most of the times because a few people will address that issue, different partners, you share them with the insight, they come on board and they are like, hey, this company wants to create new markets. They want to create new opportunities. They want to bring these people now to inclusive opportunities. Wow. So then they tend to be coming, right? So now you understand that it's something f for me personally which resonates with me to make sure that how do we bridge really some of the people, the inequality in accessibility. So that's really something we are working on ourselves in our company to make sure that more rural based young people who are a potential can be developed, can be equipped and then they get massive opportunities like the others. When I'm telling my fellow young people back in high school that, hey, by the way, we have workforce which are working for US-based companies and they are based in Kigali. They are like, is that possible? So now I wanted to bring that possibility to them as well and they say that it's possible. So that's something I can comment about that. Thank you. Excellent. Norman? Yeah, thank you so much, Vivian. Uh, thank you uh, for the great question. I think that to achieve that requires everyone, the whole ecosystem, to get engaged and involved. A, sh a short story, I can remember when I opened my first email, I was almost when I was finishing my, my, high, uh, my high school, 
trying to get opportunities and apply abroad and all that. And somebody who helped me to create uh, is a friend who created an email, a Gmail. He was from Kigali because we knew that, okay, kids who are from Kigali, they know, they know how to use internet. And for us who are from rural areas, we don't know, even don't even how to touch uh, like on their computer. So when I got the opportunity even to go and study abroad and I could see these white kids are typing and for me I'm still looking for A, B, C, no, still doing all that. But so I think it, like, but when recently when we came back and I was working with rural communities and I would visit some schools, I find even in deep villages, the schools, with, uh, they, they have, the kids have computers, they are typing, they are doing, the, there's computer class and everyone goes to the computer lab and is, I wish, oh, I wish I <laughs> had those skills before. So I think there is more of like, even the government of Rwanda is really, really doing a lot. Uh, even if, we, how do we actually empower the entire continent? Because it, we, if you have to change that one, if it's all of us to go all together, not just one single community, not just one single country, but all of us together. How do we go together? How do we support each other? How was such a conference like this can be more of this and bring, even bringing more young people, listen to their, what they understand. How do we even focus having like a conference like this, but having the, the ones that are focused in rural areas to try and teach them. I remember the first like, client when we opened our e-commerce platform, a mom called me and was like, are you sure I can order an avocado and it comes as an avocado? I can order it online and it comes as an avocado and reaches my house. Maybe he thought, maybe my thing is like, is she thinking like we're going to create something online and create it and it comes as plastic or something? So we need, but right now, since, the, since then, she has been our client and, and she has been recommending. So how do we really show people that it can work? How do we show people that it actually, it can? And it starts with, with us, it starts with everyone to get all together and go together. Thank you, Tommy. Good work. Yes, thank you so much. Um, like, um, my colleagues say mentioned uh, it's it's a problem which cannot be solved by one person. It has to be a collective effort, and it always starts from an individual basis. It starts from someone like Vivens, and then it it sprinkles down to everyone. And w if I'm to speak on behalf of my organization, like in terms of organizations, what we can do is to support people like Vivens who are trying to create impact, who are trying to make to bridge the gap. Uh, between technology and accessibility. That's what I, I believe that's what we could do as organizations and as businessmen, I think they've answered well. Uh, trying to make it, um, trying to work in a, in a way that is more of a social entrepreneurship than just for profit, because most people are looking for profit. And when you talk about bridging the gap, they start thinking, where am I gonna make the money from? So I believe it's, it's, it's gonna be collective effort. The government also has a role to play but the government has a lot to do. We cannot say to, make, to, to bridge the uh, inequality, the government has to invest the money in technology. The government has health to invest in. The government has uh, climate change to invest in. It has a lot of things. So I believe uh, it's collective effort, but it starts from individual basis. And individual basis can be as simple as we having this conversation. We creating this awareness in this small room. When we go outside, we can spread the word to other people as well and then collectively uh, depending on where you are based, if you're running an organization or if you're a businessman, you can start helping to bridge that gap slowly by slowly. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much. Um, yes, let, let us uh, invite now the audience to raise comments, questions, thoughts for further implementation. Yes, please. Our privileged partner on the SDG report of Africa. The mic, please, for our intervention. Yes. Thank you. Uh, let me start by congratulating these young entrepreneurs. Really, I'm excited. I'm so happy. Yes. Especially when you two guys, I don't know, the, 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 you know you are from rural origin. Yeah, that is really very, very, very important. If at all, if we aspire to transform our Africa. Mm -hmm. Because that is the rural economy, the agriculture is still the backbone of the economy of many of, all, almost all of the sub-Saharan African countries, mm -hmm. as you know. Two reflections. One is as entrepreneurs, what I may 
be a bit concerned is about resilience, your resilience to the global shock. You know, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, uh, there, there are, you know, issues beyond your control. Like, for instance, these days we uh, are in a kind of financial, a global financial crisis. You heard about, you know, big, big banks are collapsing and so on. So you have to have your own strategy, a strategy how to just adjust yourself to such a kind of global. That global crisis means, you know, it will be reflected, translated to the regional and then to the national and also to your uh, economy as well, to your, to your business as well. So that one is for your reflection, if you have any strategy to share with us. The other thing, Prof, you put it correctly, the four A's, adaptability, affordability, and so on. Those are the elements of sustainability. You see, sustainability, we are now, that is why we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, saying about, concerned about this sustainable development. In that sense, uh, usually what we observe in the, our African context, you know, this adaptability, affordability, accessibility, and everything, has something to, if we bring this technology innovation which is not connected to the culture, to the tradition, to working style of our rural people, then we may have a concern of sustainability. You see, so usually we disconnect ourselves from, you know, working or improving on our indigenous knowledge. That's our problem, you know. Our farmers have their own way of tackling some of the problems. But that may have been there for a long time without any advancement, without any improvement. Then the issue is how we connect this technology, this innovation, so that we can uplift, we can, you know, upgrade that indigenous knowledge. Especially with the farmers that you uh, presented now in the supply chain process, they have their own way of doing that thing. So, if we connect these new innovations, new technology, to that of the indigenous knowledge, then we may have also a solution for this adaptability, affordability account, and everything like that one. So uh, this is a reflection. If you have any comment on this, you're welcome. Otherwise, again, congratulations for <laughs> these young entrepreneurs, really. Thank you very much. These are magic questions. Thank you so much. Both, uh, both are, are very crucial. Norman, and then, yeah, Norman, please. Yeah, um, Mike for more, Norman. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for the great uh, kind of ask us to really reflect in terms of resilience. Yeah, there are challenges uh, that we are facing most like right now for us in agriculture with climate change, farmers planting and the end, re rain doesn't show up and there are other, other different challenges even financing these farmers. But uh, like for, for me, for instance, when I, was, when I came, I just, I was starting, like I had an idea, but the know-how how to implement that idea to be more sustainable. So that's why I reached out to organization like OVO, so that I can get the mentorship, I can get the skills to project, not only to look at now what I have, but look in the next 50 years. Because what I'm doing is beyond me. With or without Norman, a free farmer's market should continue and impact millions of local farmers and even households across sub-Saharan Africa. So how do I really, what I was, what I was thinking about is how do I reach that goal? How do I have the right people alongside me? The people who have the skills, people who have the passion, like organization that can help me connect with the uh, investment, that can help me, how do I use that investment? How do I understand that regardless of being the owner of the company, the money is not for me, it's for the company. I should be also an employee and being pay, get a salary. So that is really like some of the things I've been taking to get, really, how do we be resilient uh, 
or resistant to solve those challenges that we are really facing because they are and we are not they're not they're not going to be there but i do believe that those challenges that come they really come to strengthen us to make us better entrepreneurs to make us look at those uh, solutions and think more creatively and innovatively like they have been talking about um and the other thing is uh for for like for when we started like you mentioned like farmers had their own way cutting that basket or reaching or having those communal markets where they can sell or even trade with the neighbors and all that so when we came actually because there have been those middlemen who have been exploiting them and the, when we came they're like how are you even different from other middlemen that we've been receiving then we started in a way of getting them engaged we started okay let's give them trainings for free let's give them access to finance like we give you a loan you can grow and then after growing and you harvest you can pay back that money and that money can go back and again support you so then we started seeing farmers now trusting our process trusting learning and even encouraging others i remember the first meeting with her, we had with farmers there were very few but when we came we went back and after like one season two season farmers are even calling like hey can how can we work with you so again is looking at how do we not bringing idea which I think should work for me, what, what the community should work. And I've seen many projects have been failing because we think for the community. We don't allow the community to think for themselves. And then we enable their ideas. We enable their thoughts. We enable their vision. Like when OVO comes to support the mentors, they're not bringing ideas from, they first listen to me and understand where, what's the vision. Where do I want to reach? And how can they help me in that vision? So to support those communities is to understand, sit with them. Okay, what are the challenges? What do you think would be the possible solutions? How can we work together? And then you work the journey with them. And I'm sure you can achieve sustainable development. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, please. Give me my, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so for me, I'm a friend to the problems. Uh, that's my, a way to make sure that I have the problem so that I can resolve it. And the resilience, as you have said, for me, I got an opportunity to start breeding really the startup, which can impact, but also which can sustain itself in terms of even money. I knew the concepts before around, can we breed something which is not based on a donation and it can be sustainable? And then from there, you start from day one to think about the series as well. Of course, you are building an impactful solution. The reason why it's really good is because they will receive the value proposition and they will pay for it. If maybe traditional companies have been maybe hiring and it is taking them one month to three months on average to find the right person for their job. And with us, normally we do it in uh, probably two days, one day. I remember if you see BK Arena there, the time they hired the digital marketing specialist, they send us the request at uh, 10 a.m. in the morning. 8 p.m., we sent them two qualifying candidates. Next day, they approved one of the best from the two. Only in two days, why did they have been hustling to pass around? So it means if you give them that access and that innovation, they pay for it. So it's now a call to action to us as well to really make sure that how do we prioritize the revenues which can sustain our companies and of course to be an entrepreneurial resilience is, uh, is highly um, recommended because you are passing a lot of troubles on a daily basis and the tough challenges it's always uh, most of the times it takes more than a passion and you think that this is necessary and I have to do it and I remember one thing we can congratulate you over is when they come to entrepreneurs, they are like, of course, you are building a good business, good innovation, you are solving a big problem, but we wanted to see it being sustainable. That's why, as of now, I passed through different programs to enable our company to grow. But whenever I meet with all the guys, I tell them, I, I salute them to two things. They focus much on the financial growth for your startup. And the second, they are the guys who really enable you to think about the risk ahead of your business. And then that's a really great message I can send it to them. You understand that as of now, they have been guiding us really to make sure that, guys, make sure that from your innovation, you get revenues to sustain you. So you understand that it's really a game to action. And to think that technology is not a driver, however, is a facilitator, as you mentioned. When you think that technology is going to drive the things, we kill it. In Africa, we are the biggest market is offline. 
However, how do we bring technology now to facilitate what was happening to make sure that technology can work for the people and the target market we are targeting? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes, my two colleagues have preemptively addressed it. <laughs> it's basically, uh, so um, on behalf of OVO, uh, they have basically explained it. It's co-creating solutions. So I believe co-creating solutions with the people you're trying to work with is very important. Okay, next uh, question, comment. Question. Yes, please, over there. One, two, yep. Three. Okay, Mike. Yeah, yes, please. My name is Dr. Emmanuel Tonokari. I'm from Nigeria. I'm happy and happy as I could be to listen to this very conversation. And one of those things that really struck me is that the university is not innovative. While I was a student back then in France, one young Kenyan, he decided to leave France and he came back. I said, Titus, why are you abandoning your studies? He said, he's not learning anything. He came back to Kenya and today, he has done so much to the extent that the government recognized him. When we are talking about rethinking holistic education, and the university is not innovative, I think I go with that. But after giving us this discussion, you talked about backward, backward design. We failed. How can you help us in academics to retrace our steps back? Because we are moving faster than us right inside academics. We need to retrace our steps and see how we could work together. Thank you. Thank you. We, we will connect uh, all the, also the next questions. Yes, next questions over that, over there. Yes, please, the mic to the lady in the middle. Thank you. I am Juliana Matthew Lat from Nigeria. Uh, your presentations are quite interesting. And I see uh, it's like uh, you say his name is. Uh, oh, normally, I enjoyed your presentation, and because our people are mostly farmers, and I saw the way you set. Uh, their problems could be solved. That is linking your technology and their productions to solve uh, post-harvest losses and so on. Now, oftentimes we have gaps between production and consumption. And as a result of that, there are times that uh, sometimes you see that because there was a post-harvest loss in the last season, in the next season, there will be scarcity because people will not want to uh, involve themselves again in so much production, believing that there will be losses. Now, in solving some of these problems, I don't know how you do it to bridge that gap and sometimes, too, it could be uh, maybe aside the economic situation of the people that are meant to be the consumers. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. The natural uh, situations that are not determined by man also affect the farmers themselves. Sometimes uh, implements like fertilizers become difficult for some to afford or to access. Numerous problems. So I don't understand or I wish to know how some of these problems can be bridged so that there will be constant and sustainable production and consumption of the right foodstuff by the people. I know that there is a multiplier effect. If the right food items are gotten by people at all times and consumed, I know health challenges too will be solved by that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, next question over there. Thank you. My name is Mutunu Asemari Claudine. I'm a university student. Uh, he has been saying about students who graduate and not yet ready for the job market. Me, I'm wondering, how comes I student spent four years or three years in a university and yet I can't be ready for market? What is missing? <laughs> is it me? Is it university or <laughs> one who prepared the course? And why can they cooperate and maybe tell them this is what is missing, maybe you can use this way if it has been shown that this way is not working. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice issue. So last question to be collected. Yes, on our left side, from my perspective. Thank you very much. My name is Jean-Baptiste Atiyakimana. I manage the Stewardship Agribusiness Incubation Center and we are members of the SDSN. Thank you very much for all the presentations. Uh, and my question go to the partner from OVO. Uh, we have seen that uh, Africa's growing population should not be a problem because uh, we know that about 60% of the world arable land is in Africa. And education itself should not be a problem as well because when you s look at the resources, uh, starting from the University of Rwanda, there is a number of resources, many resources, mm -hmm. but still the utilization of the resources is questionable. Because uh, you see, uh, like Vivian talked about it, the employability capacity of the graduates is still questionable. Because uh, you see the young graduates from agriculture related fields, have never interacted with the, with the soil. And we know food comes from the soil. When you never interact with the soil, how do you think food is going to be available? Uh, we have rain, good rains, we have, uh, we talk about climate change topics, but changing the uh, change of the climate, the change in terms of climate patterns should not be a concern as it used to be from the years when you go to ecological sciences, you see, a Sahara Desert maybe used to be a good place for living. Now, the problem is not the curriculum. The, the problem is the structural uh, way things are because uh, we, we are in endless processes that never takes an end to go uh, to the other side of the bridge because uh, young people are in the process you see uh, a limited number of the courageous young people and entrepreneurs who take the advantage of that limiting uh, uh, challenges that are business opportunities, but the level of impacting, uh, having uh, the, the subsectoral approaches, like we are talking about the, the young graduates in ICTs and the other data management uh, sub, uh, sub courses, like the company of events, we talk about the innovative solutions to bridge the gaps between the producers and consumers, like our colleague Norman talked about it. We, we see the trends on engaging the use of Africa to do practical farming, but the problem is how do we um, work with the rest of collaborators to make sure that we cut, we, we shorten the processes of, uh, of having a mass population because uh, we, we, we tend to delay in the processes, and yet the, uh, the generation is, yeah, is going. Time is moving. Time is moving. Yeah? When you look at the past 10 years, maybe the yield is not increasing. We should increase the production volume because of intensified method of production, but the yield itself is not increasing. It is diminishing because we have a number of factors that are not considered. Now, my problem is to to take the use of Africa through that process. How do we ensure that we work with the rest of collaborators, including the university's uh, structural challenges that still uh, can produce a number of graduates who have never interacted with their soil, and yet they are supposed to go and uh, build and upgrade to the existing production. Because in Rwanda, if we have seven to eight tons of uh, a sweet potato per hectare, 
yet the production capacity can go up to 30, 40, it is a problem now. How do we ensure that practical uh, base of knowledge is dispensed and also the, enge the practical engagement in the lower field that can upgrade and uh, to move further in the fourth industrial revolution area with courage and sustainability? Because uh, having the upper, uh, upper nodes sustained without the lower nodes sustained, uh, that is my okay. concern. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so uh, time is running out, so we, we, we should uh, move now quickly to the panel. Um, Benoit and then the other colleagues. Yes, please. Yes. Mike, okay, thank you so much. So I will begin with his question because I think it was directed to me. Um, bridging that gap between, uh, let's say, institutions and the work, working environment is not going to be an easy one, but it's doable. Uh, and one of the ways I believe this can be done is um, um, involving the different stakeholders. Universities are preparing students to go into the workforce, but are universities interacting with the employers in the workforce? Most of the time, we find that they are not interacting with the employers in the workforce. Universities are training students so that they can pass the exams, and then when they go out, they start again from afresh, because now they are, have to interact with the real world. Like he was saying, students are going to universities to learn, let's say, agriculture. It's going to be purely theoretical and maybe some lab practices. But when you step into the real world, you realize that the land you're interacting with is changing from time to time, or there are some other factors that are involved in that you've never uh, learned about when you are still in universities. And one of the ways I believe this can be done is universities collaborating with employers. And this could be done through either extensive internships, let's say summer internships where students have compulsory internships to go and interact with the real world, or um, creating prog co-creating programs uh, by universities and the, and the workforce, because you find that universities are still even teaching courses that uh, do not uh, fully um, encompass what is needed in the real world. When you look at students who are doing finances today, let's say financial regulators today, now when you go into the real world today, we meet cryptocurrency. Do we have cryptocurrency regulators? We don't have them because that's something which is foreign. But maybe if there was a way for universities to interact with the real world where they bring even these new technologies, cryptocurrencies, to come and help the universities design programs which can apply in the real world, it will help better. The other thing I would hint on is being a lifetime learner. Uh, most of the time, when students go to school and graduate, they believe the learning is done and they know it's all, so they're not going to step into the real world and make changes. But that's not how it works. Even when you're in the real world and practicing already, you still have to improve all the time. Today, you cannot graduate from medicine and be a doctor and have a career for 20 years without having to update your knowledge. It's almost impossible because of the technological changes which are happening. You have to keep updating your knowledge. You, have, you may have to go back to university and learn some courses. So I'll say two things. Universities co-creating programs with employers in the real world to address the challenges on ground and also have, making students understand that they have to become lifetime learners. Even what you're learning, even if the co-creation is happening, the learning is not enough in itself. We are constantly learning and adapting because challenges are going to be different when you go into the real world. Yes, that would be my answer to that. Excellent. Thanks. Norman? Um, thank you so much for, for the great question about how, uh, first of all, like we were talking about technology, we are also looking at how Technology really helps us to um, to help these farmers ensure that they don't just produce because they have. This is the challenge we faced at the beginning. So you find like now we're working with more than 5,000 local farmers in Rwanda, but you find like maybe like 60% of them are producing one type of crop at the same time, like harvesting all that at the same time. And after three or two months, there's deficit, there's no more supply of that. Maybe let's use an like example of tomatoes. So what we are using is to look at the, using the data we are collecting using, using the technology, looking at the, uh, the consumption part, the customers, what is the demand? Then we can advise the farmers actually what to grow and when and how, depending on the quality they need. So we are leveraging that power of technology also to give us the, the clear information that we should, should talk to the farmers. Now, 
when we do contracted farmers, we tell them actually what to grow, to grow something that is ready for the market. Not just grow anyhow because they have a farm or they are seeing a farm, they have the produce, but can, is, is it on demand? Is it necessary on the market? So that's how we, are, we have been working with that one to ensure that from the information we are collecting from the demand on the market, what is more needed, then we can advise farmers on what to grow and when and how to harvest it and all that. Also in the times, like you mentioned about other things that are beyond our, our capacity, like, like maybe climate change, you know, heavy rains and all that. But we've also been partnering with like different uh, organizations, even with the government of Rwanda, how do we ensure that they have the best agricultural practices, they can have cheap irrigation using solar energy, uh, how do they have even growing greenhouses, so that to ensure that, they, because, like for instance, like a free farmer's market, if we sign a contract with a, with a I was actually talking it when we were going for, uh, for, healthy, for healthy break, it's like, how do, if a, a hotel, I remember what this has happened one, and they're they running from experience, like he's talking about, like, I remember one of the day they asked, they ordered for mangoes, and I said, Actu actually today we can't get mangoes. And the manager of the hotel called him, he's like, hey, I cannot wake up in the morning and tell my clients that there is no breakfast. Go outside and get breakfast and come back. So if you are my supplier, you make sure that I have what I ask. So that's my responsibility to look for that. So now, now I use that experience, that knowledge, and go and find a way. How do I ensure that these farmers can produce throughout the year? And it's talking about uh, partnering with this and having irrigation and all that. So that's how we've been doing. There's something, really quick, just one minute. There's something, uh, is it Mutoni? Yes. yes. She asked something, I know it is for events, but it really touches my heart because I have more than 20 employees that are working for a free farmer's market. But the challenge is, you graduate, you come and look at the CV and all that, but I give you the job, you can't do it. That's the challenge. We are not ready for the marketplace, like something I mentioned about. We don't have to implement what we've learned from school into, because I do, how can the universities, at least in the universities, education be 30, 40% theory, 60% practical? Because it's what not theory, not what you had, it's what actually can be able to deliver what actually can be able to do. How do we change that one? How make our education a given percentage, just theory to learn about, okay, they did this, they did, but how do we implement that one? Let me, as I'm finalizing, before going to study abroad, I was doing still agriculture, but we spent almost the semester, just everything was in class. We, we visited like a farm like three or four times, and I even just go and see how things are, are there. But when I joined there, I would wake up 6 a.m. until midday, I'm in the farm. I'm growing. I know if it's a tomato, how does it grow? What nutrients it needs? What the sunlight? How everything measuring every step. So if I'm hired as an agronomist in crop production, I know what to do instead of just sitting and then okay, it grows like this. You know, it will need this. It will no the practical experience. Maybe events can go ahead. Okay, so uh, thanks for posing uh, the question to me around saying that how can I spend four years in the university and uh, I'm not ready for the job market? And again, you said, okay, how to blame? Is it me? Is it a university or is it something else? I think I have seen a vice chancellor here, I think for College of Education. I don't know, but what I want to say is not to blame our business, but last year, to where if young people dropped from uh, the University of Rwanda, because they were a part of our assessment programs and upskilling. And then some of them were doing computer science, others were doing media, and the, the other two who were normally in business administration. And then we got the opportunities for them. I, I, one even is a software developer is earning more than one million five hundred thousand on a monthly basis. All of them. They left the university, now they are into the jobs. And it took them only six months to one year to be ready for those amazing opportunities. What do I mean here? So for me, I said, I don't have anyone to blame, being government programs, being university student. However, if I can fix the problem, how can I engage them? And this is what we are working on. The issue of unemployment is in two ways. Before our traditional market, like uh, these guys who are in agriculture, when you talk about agriculture, we talk about retail, we talk about normal logistics and the trading. 
these industries do not grow massively when it comes to creating more jobs. It's not easy for maybe Simerwa as an industry to double its employees even in, in four to five years to come. However, the media space, these guys you see who are shooting videography and animation here, this industry is growing massively on an annual basis, tripling opportunities every year. There was an issue where we prioritized what our government was looking for. Then as of now, the STEM education you have seen here, it's growing faster. Now you find that the opportunities are limited to what you were trained for. Then if you are coming as 1,000 people, where there are only 50 opportunities, some of the guys immediately are going to miss jobs. That's one aspect. Another aspect is now generally not to be ready. Now you are doing a computer science, and you come and if we give you the assessment, because on our side it's clear, if you are a mobile or app developer, we have the project-based test, you are going to design a mobile app to make sure that you are ready for the, the job market. And I appreciate for these young ladies who are here maybe facilitating some people in the protocol because here now you are maybe running a communication, how to organize things, how you can adapt to some people who are not respecting instructions. And those are the core, core workplace skills that we are looking for. And most of the times if you come to us and you tell us that, by the way, I volunteered Two days, we will ask you, by the way, what did you run from there? How did you cope up with problem solving? How did you maybe apply uh, the critical thinking ability? If you can respond to that to me very well, I'm sure that we can train you three months maybe to be a good project manager. And if there is an opportunity, you are going to grab the opportunity. So now it's all about the, the whole approach. And if it all goes well, our company initiated the conversation with Rwanda Development Board so that we can test and assess all graduates on the Rwandan market, and we get real data to know these people graduated, they are ready for jobs, and this one is graduated, but they don't have a jobs. Now, what will happen? The assessment tool becomes a tool either to get jobs or to get a specific training. If UNICEF is going to invest 10 billion in education in Rwanda, it will be immediately will give them real time insights that this is where the jobs are growing this year, next five years. Invest in TVT programs, maybe invest in finance. So that's how the methodology is going to be done. No one to blame. However, is how now we need to probably, if there is a solution, how do right partners come in a place? And if you are in the University of Rwanda, please connect with me after this as well so that we can see whether there are some opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we, we, have, we have to close here because uh, time is running out and, and the Vice Chancellor is, is waiting. So we, we can argue that with this kind of, of, of profiles, of this young leadership, these young, bright, young entrepreneurs, yes, Africa will be the continent of the hope. Thank you so much. Thank you also for this interactive session. Thanks for the questions and the comments. But let us express our gratitude, uh, clapping hands for all those members of the panel. Thanks so much.
Hello again, uh, those in the room, those of you who don't have your proofs of payment, I repeat again, please go to the lady behind and he gives you a uh, proof of payment. You may need it somewhere. And uh, please, uh, we have the Vice Chancellor, the Principal around here. We're going to start the closing ceremony of this great event for the past three days. Uh, and uh, shortly, we have the people who have been presenting down there arrive here, and after that, um, we'll have, I would say, four brief uh, speeches, one from the convener of this conference, and then the principal for his commentary, and then the closing remarks from the vice chancellor. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for being active till this last day. Well appreciated. And I do believe that uh, we provided a link for you to register if you want to go to, you know, the memorial, genocide memorial. I hope you've done that. If for some reason you've not been able to register, things happen last minute, you still can join. But the best practice is that everyone is registered so that we take care of the logistics. But if there is anything that happened and you are not able to register, please, you can still inform the protocol team and they include you on the list manually. For those of you who have mission orders, please, those of you who have mission orders, take them at the back. Someone has to sign them so that you take it signed. The mission orders are always uh, authorization of travel, of travel, sorry, especially in the local context here. And the protocol team, please, you may tell the people to rush in. I know most of them are concluding their presentations. By the time we left, they were coming here. So you may remind them to hurry so that uh, we close as per the time we agreed. And you have, if you have any urgent inquiry, please you may pass it on or you tell one of the protocol people so that we also communicate it.
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the ushers, you may remain that one person who is still outside to get in so that we make good use of time. Uh, again, for an announcement, repeating those who have paid and you need your receipts, please be at the back so that you are given the receipts. Second, if you have the mission order that you need signed, please, again, deposit it at the back so that someone uh, is able to sign it for you. I know they're going to need it for other logistical uh, justifications. And uh, I know some of you, all of us actually, would want to have a certificate, um, a justification for us coming here and spending our time in a worthwhile manner for three days. Huge achievement, huge effort, huge sacrifice. Now, uh, we want to assure you that uh, being this big group, the way it is, how busy we've all been, and considering that we've had sessions on ICT and uh, having to do things differently, we are going to send you your certificates online. And I wanted uh, Benjamin to do the needful. You know what I mean, Benjamin? We have this code that we agreed on. That is the certificate that you're going to get. Please uh, take time to print it, possibly with the best ink that you can ever come across. That's it. And uh, it's going to be uh, customized to your name and, 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 the, and the theme uh, in which you presented. Remember, we had four themes. Uh, and it's critical that we capture that as well. So that was it. We're going to send this one to you. Make sure, of course, that we have your name correct. The ushers have been do doing a good job to verify the names. And the beauty with online, if there is any slate later, which I don't think that misses out, you can still notify us and we change that. You may have it off uh, Benjamin. Wanted to have you to have an idea. Dear Vice Chancellor, Dear principal, delegates from different countries, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Of course, you may not. We've come to the end of our three days here. Uh, we want, as Michael, the MC, has been working with you tirelessly. Uh, no, no apology, but I want to really appreciate how fast you've been doing things here. We had a huge program, and I'll tell you why. If we wanted to have very few people present here, we would have kept few people again. So we agreed that we have as many presenters very eager to present and share their knowledge, but also have a cost to that. And the cost to that is limiting time. So we do appreciate that you also do appreciate that we were many, but every person, dear Vice Chancellor, who submitted an article, an abstract, was reviewed, was accepted, was sent an, invita an invitation Every other person has had time to present and share his or her ideas with this big audience. You may give yourself a round of applause for that. For being so fast, I think there is a culture that we need to, to learn as academicians. Brief is good. Always leave people curious and don't give them everything. So that is a plus that we did it very fast. You're going to have emails flood you to give further explanations, and that is good. Of course, I'm not trying to justify how fast we've been, but that's part of the deal. Uh, dear Vice Chancellor, uh, we've had a great team here. Uh, from 15 countries, we're represented. Of course, including Rwanda as, as the 16th one. When we first launched this course, we didn't expect that we'd have this group, because it was the first most of you are first travelers to Rwanda. We even appreciate that you had the trust. It's one thing to submit the paper, and it's one thing to believe in the country that you are coming to. And we honestly appreciate that, and we think you're going to come, since this is going to be, there's going to be another call for papers. And we have had all these countries, 15 of them, most of the countries having as many as 15 delegates. And that, is, that shows how eager we want to share our knowledge. Uh, for the presenters, great job. And we all have been. If you didn't present and you listened, that is also 
fair enough. That was the presentation itself. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge everyone uh, who uh, made an effort to uh, not only present, but also share some, share some stories. We meet here to present, but there's a lot that we can share. Culturally, stories, those sm small stories that you talked beyond the presentations, they count a lot too, because that's what unites us as human beings. And for us as a country, we are so privileged that you could share a piece of you with us, a piece of your culture, a piece of your identity. We so much appreciate that. Uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, dear uh, principal, guests, uh, colleagues, we don't want to spend much time uh, and want to invite the convener of this uh, event to make his uh, brief remarks. And then after that, we hear from our principal and then uh, from our vice chancellor, and then we'll be communicating other pieces of, of information later. Thank you. Vice Chancellor, University of Rwanda, Principal, College of Education, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Yeah, I believe that during these three days, all of us have had a fruitful discussion. In this first uh, international conference, on reshaping education for sustainable development, whose main theme was reshaping education for sustainable uh, development, uh, whose main theme was rethinking, sorry, holistic education for the fourth industrial revolution. We have learned a lot from the keynote spe speakers uh, delivered by well-informed uh, keynote speakers and the parallel sessions which are, have been delivered by very uh, through workshop researchers, policy makers, development partners, and uh, practitioners. Once again, on behalf of the conference committees, thank you for delivering such important materials so that all of us can deepen our knowledge about contemporary trends and uh, advances in education. Moreover, I would like to thank all presenters and participants. We have actually registered, as uh, the MC have said, 14 countries who, whose participants have uh, attended the conference, but Rwanda is also among, is also the, the 15th country. And uh, we have also registered over uh, 200 participants. So we are very thankful for all of you, presenters, participants, to have joined us for this conference. I am certain that every presenter has shared the findings and received insightful feedback, which will help improve the work for publication. I sincerely hope that through your presentation and discussion afterwards, all of us can contribute to solving the educational problems in our countries. Even though the contribution may be small, but it is still valuable. Although this is the last day of the conference, the conference process is not yet over there are still steps that should be done. I would like to make some more announcement on this. First, please edit your manuscripts according to comments received here during this conference, received during the parallel sessions. 
and you enrich them with the keynote speeches, but also the parallel sessions, which were held here. Second, uh, in academia, we say that you either publish or perish. So this is an opportunity for us uh, to publish our work. We intend to, to have a special issue of the Rwanda Journal of Education, where the, the works you have been discussing during this uh, conference, because this was the key function, can be published. But for that, because it is an academic journal, uh, peer-reviewed, we need to, to, to follow some processes. Uh, we will send you a link, an email, regarding the publication guidance, guidance of, the, of the journal. And then you will have to submit your, your manuscripts following the, those guidelines within one month, starting from here, from, from, from today. So then, further, you will be invited to revise your papers according to reviewers' comments and adjust your papers according to the requirements of the Gwanda Journal of Education. Furthermore, this is another announcement. We plan to organize every year a conference like this one. Uh, we hope that uh, in Feb, February 2024, we could be able to organize a second conference. So far, we have a wide range of themes for the next conference. We would have liked to, to announce you the theme for the next conference, but it is not possible. This is why we are saying that we are going again to send you a link where you can vote so that you can retain a theme that, is, uh, that gets consensus. Bear with us, we are going to send you uh, a link because you have your emails. Uh, on, at this juncture, I would like to thank all the committee members for organizing this conference and ensuring that it proceeded smoothly. I also wish to apologize for any inconvenience that you might have experienced during this conference. Vice-Chancellor, Principal, ladies and gentlemen, there is a saying in Kinyarwanda that umwanzu wabantu ni gihe. I may say that uh, our enemy is the time. <laughs> we would have liked to extend our discussions until tomorrow, over the weekend, but uh, Time, you know, time is always against us. I am certain that you are all looking forward to getting back to your respective homes. So I thank you once again for your participation and wish you all a safe journey home. I hope you enjoyed your stay here in our lovely city of Chigari, as well as our conference. And I do also hope that we can meet again early next year, 2024. Thank you. Yes, yes, uh, we, the prof says, we hope you enjoyed your stay here. We also hope you appreciate how much 
we enjoyed your stay here, your culture, your stories. And, and someone, one of you said, you, you say 15 countries, would we want to know how many countries so that we really have a deep appreciation of how far people came? And then that person said, we may not want you to say the names, but someone else. And uh, we've been doing this work with Flor, I mean with uh, uh, Dr. Dorothy, a colleague at the University of Rwanda College of Education. Uh, we've done this one together and uh, we wanted to do it together throughout. So over to you. All right, uh -huh. thank you. So the people actually have come all the way from Belgium, Vosogod, Ghana, uh, Cameroon, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Finland, German, and Portugal. Now, that's how, that's how far you've come. Uh, that's how far you're going to travel back. Uh, do, do we have any country? Because some people came, are registered. We picked this one on internet. In, anyone here from another country that hasn't been mentioned? Please, we want to really acknowledge you as well. And we apologize for any omission which we doubt was there, but just in case it's there, we still apologize. So, perfect. So I, I invite the okay. Uh, now, actually, I would like to invite the principal uh, to say his remarks. And then after again, the principal actually will invite the, our guests of honor. Thank you. Dear Vice Chancellor, University of Rwanda, and our guest honor for the closure of our conference. Uh, dear uh, guest from partner institutions uh, here in Rwanda and abroad, uh, dear delegates uh, from different countries that have been presented to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon once again. So uh, I don't have many things uh, to present as we close. Uh, because the conference convener and I guess our vice chancellor who will close this event will just uh, make what I was going to present. But for the sake of time, of course, I didn't make any long speech. So uh, my s I'm here standing saying thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for having responded to our invitation. As I said in the beginning, we are just launching our first edition of this conference, Reshaping Education for Sustainable Development. The entire world is in a constant change and the skills of today will not be the skills uh, of tomorrow. That's why as educators, as educational researchers, we have to keep the pace with the change uh, so that we provide the best education to our children, to our youth. You know, you have seen that we have been all very busy. I can't fail uh, to thank you all for your attendance from day one up to this last day. Because we, we, we've been participating in the conferences and the last day is the most critical as far as attendance is concerned. But the fact that now this, you are, you know, this hall is not empty, at least you, have, you are occupying all the tables, demonstrate that you expressed your interest in this conference. And as the conference convener has mentioned, our only enemy is time, otherwise would 
like to continue discussing, uh, sharing our experiences, our findings, and uh, having more time for, for networking. I thank uh, very much all chairpersons of parallel sessions. They did a great job. I know we had many, many sessions but they tried to manage time. Uh, I was doubting that the time is not sufficient, but I didn't receive any complaint that in any person couldn't just have a little time to present. So for that, chairpersons of parallel stations, please, I thank you very much with all my heart. Of course, I thank you along with the reporter of every uh, sessions, every session that was uh, organized. Uh, I also thank uh, our committees. We had the three committees. The first one was the organizing committees, that is the overall committee. Uh, I really thank you for the great job. I know that the idea to organize this conference started earlier last year, and it was maturing, maturing progressively until it happens. So the technical uh, subcommittee and the communication committee, uh, thank you very much for the great job that you did to ensure that we prepare the ground for this, this conference. I also thank the technical team here for the good sound and image that they shared with us so that every, everyone, wherever they are sitting, they could uh, follow the message that is being delivered by different uh, presenters. I really acknowledge the work you did behind to ensure that there are no disruption. There are many people that we can thank, the protocol team and the person, the UR staff, uh, Madam Ansh, who is in charge of uh, keeping this site uh, for her support so that we can have this venue well arranged. Uh, so that was my word of thanks. And as the convener have said, we wish this event to be on a regular basis, we can make it in one year or in two years, but we shall ensure that we keep in touch and we convene once again uh, to discuss matters around reshaping our education and uh, be able to, to move forward and uh, to develop ourselves as a country uh, as the region, share our experiences about the networks that we have established from here and other friends that we have been able to, uh, to reach out so that they can join us in our, our, our journey of reshaping education. I know uh, after this, the guests of honor, we shall have the lunch and there is an event for those who registered uh, to visit uh, the genocide memorial. I thank also for your goodwill to come and to testify our history. We shall be with you all along. And those who will not manage to be with us because time is not allowing them, they want to go back home, to travel back to their country, I really wish you a safe travel uh, to, to your home. Otherwise, we, we thank you once again very much, and we hope to meet you in such similar event. Thank you. On this occasion, I invite our guest honor, our vice chancellor for the University of Uganda for the closing remarks.
dear vice chancellors from our partner universities, if uh, some of you are still around, the deputy vice chancellor for finance, who that was as well as uh, the chair of the SD, SDSCN Great Lakes, dear principal, College of Education, heads of different organizations here present, Professor Wensisras Nzabarirgua, I think I need to pause a bit and so that you may feel it, that we are proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests and delegates, friends of the University of Rwanda, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed, uh, very good afternoon. It is, again, with the greatest pleasure that I join you today as we come to the end of this fantastic three days international conference on reshaping education for sustainable development. Let me first express my gratitude to you all for having participated in this maiden conference. Uh, my colleagues have just said that, that this is the beginning and you will be remembered in history for having been uh, part of this maiden conference. This is the beginning and I believe you have just had three good days of discussions around rethinking holistic education for the fourth industrial revolution. Indeed, in these three days conference, policymakers, academicians, practitioners, development partners, and postgraduate students have all shared their experiences, experiences and research related ideas and all outcomes around various topics presented via plenary sessions, panel discussions, and breakaway sessions. I have noted that there are many of you who have come from different countries, from our beautiful continent, Africa, and even beyond from Europe. The convener was saying his target for next year will be to bring uh, North American board, maybe also the Middle East and the rest to join. Otherwise, we thank you all from different countries. With all these 204 participants, from the 15 countries as we are read out, we want to say thank you very much for having responded to our invitations. Some of key take home from this conference include the fact that quality higher education cannot be achieved if lower levels of education, that is pre-primary, primary and secondary education, still have gaps. This is, and I'm happy that you have gotten this as your key take home because I have been convinced and I have always been discussing with my colleagues at different levels, at ministry or anywhere else, that for us to be having quality, good higher education, we need to invest much in this pre-university education. Hence, uh, synergy and quality enforcement mechanisms across all levels of education are required to ensuring that education remains relevant and feeds labor markets with competent workforce. Also, innovation and use of top technologies in education should be championed. And of course, everywhere you go, like the MTN does uh, mention, everywhere you go, you have to feel a mention of innovation, technology, and so it has to fit in all spheres, especially in education, because if you would not embrace it, it's just like what uh, Prof. Sisra said, if you would not embrace technology, we are risking to perish. It was also found that with COVID-19 pandemic, lots of lessons were learned and some of such should not be put at waste. You know, we often say there is always a blessing in this case, or in hardships, in hard circumstances, there is always a benefit to get there. We also benefited from COVID because it opened us to know that we need to embrace more of technology into all our ways of life, into teaching, into goods delivery, into purchasing, to every other kind of life. 
my background is law. We had not, we had never thought that we could even plead or that there would be a jury, a panel of judges, a bench, hearing cases virtually. That had never been thought about. But we did it during COVID and we are still doing it even now after COVID. These achievements include investment in access to and use of ICTs and collaboration to solve common challenges. That's how some of the key not speeches reiterated the imperative for inter-country and inter-institutional partnerships and baskets including those for research. Issue to do with inclusive and special needs education, gender equity, school leadership, STEM and non-STEM. Uh, the last session I attended uh, the group, there was a, that big discussion and a wonderful professor of history was saying, this emphasis of STEM into SDGs is really, uh, I mean, it requires people to rethink about it. SDGs also to look at non-STEM uh, uh, subjects and uh, issues, and I found it fitting. Not because I belong to that, but also because they are found to be imperative. Funding and costs to education were also discussed as they were they are key in and beyond education ecosystem. We are cognizant that time has been short and sometimes hard to manage, but we are happy that uh, at least every presenter here on the site had a chance to present and get feedback on his, on his or her presentation. Recommendations emanating from the survey will help in the organization of our next conference. Some of these recommendations include, I'm listing a few that were raised by some of you, that there needs to be a more conference branding, there needs to be a robust communication ahead of the conference to provide regular updates, availing more print conference related stationaries, thinking of more days for the conference or more parallel sessions, establishing more flexible modes of payment, mapping, booking and proposing accommodation venues for participants, ensuring parallel rooms are distant uh, from one another and have all have soundproof of equipment so that you may not interrupt each other collecting uh, collect meal preferences ahead of uh, the conference thinking of blended conference in future to give more chances to those who cannot make it physically and many others those are just a few that were uh, collected from you that will help us to make, I mean, to improve on our preparations, to improve on our conference uh, proceedings. We consider these recommendations as lessons learned, and for the next conference organization, we are optimistic that it will be much better. Remember, this was just the first uh, URCEU, University of Rwanda College of Education conference, and uh, I really commend the principal. I know how much this cost you, especially that you were not all that available with all the other duties that we know. The principal college of education is part of the small group of people that uh, were selected to revisit, to review, like we are talking about reshaping education. We also want to reshape the University of Rwanda and he's part of that team that is looking at how we can best reshape our University of Rwanda. We know that the first step is always a challenging uh, exercise, but it is the determinant. We now know, and we've noted some of these challenges we've encountered, and they will form the basis of our improvement for the next conference. Nevertheless, we are proud that the University of Rwanda, through the College of Education, is positioning itself as a center for desired changes in education for a sustainable goal. As you might have been informed, we want to position the University of Rwanda to where it is uh, supposed to be. And because of that, each college of the six that we have now, soon to be seven, is trying to uh, reposition itself. And as College of Education was here busy, we had an ongoing 
parallel conference, international conference, that also attracted very good uh, participation for, for, uh, organized by the College of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine. And they are all, they have been all uh, attracted, um, they have attracted a good uh, participation. This is paramount because universities, uh, University of Rwanda's College of Education is not only the teacher training hub for general secondary schools and teacher training colleges, but also the right hand for the Rwandan education policy making institutions and non-government organizations with education-related interventions. This morning, when I received a guest from the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, uh, he was wondering why the College of Education had the biggest population at our university, and I said that was a deliberate choice by our government. The University of Rwanda is a public institution, the only university in Rwanda, a public university, and uh, that we, for us to satisfy the demands from secondary and primary education, we had to raise the numbers to that. I mean, and now the College of Education, the biggest college uh, of all other colleges that we have at the University of Rwanda. As we look forward for another REC ESD conference next year, I don't know whether the dates are determined yet. Therefore, let me thank everyone once again for having participated and contributed in the various panel sessions. For our guests who are going back to their home countries today and tomorrow or some days to come, we wish you a safe travel back to your respective countries and we hope that you have, I mean, that you have had enjoyable stay here and that it will motivate you to travel back or even to tell a colleague, a friend to travel along with you next year or even before uh, to come back to Rwanda. For those staying for a few more days, we are happy and we are glad to be with you and you'll have time to visit Rwanda and you enjoy the beauties uh, here in Rwanda and enjoy the land of a thousand hills. We call them a thousand hills. We call ourselves the land of a thousand hills and a thousand opportunities. So, as you stay around, find out what would be the opportunities for you more than the conference uh, uh, proceedings that we went. I wish you all a good afternoon and may God bless you all, but I want to thank you for having made us hosts because we could not be if you were not, if you were not to be there. But also, we think you've shaped us to becoming more and more good hosts because raising these feedbacks that I've read to you and many more others that we did not list will make us a better host next time. And we are going to be improving more and more. Maybe before I conclude uh, my closing remarks, I want to say to submit our sincere condolences to the colleagues from Kenya. Uh, yeah, colleagues from one university in Kenya that uh, lost their colleagues today. Colleagues who are going for, I think they were going all coming from a field trip and as we speak now, maybe the numbers will be increasing, but 41 of them are dead. Uh, our heartfelt condolences, and uh, we pray for the souls of those departed to have uh, an eternal peace. Maybe if you allow principal, convener, the moderators, May we rise for a minute of silence as we remember our colleagues, researchers who have gone missing. Thank you. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. It's an academic fraternity. We are all in Soran Good. We are all together. So um, I know we've ended, but uh, I thought my colleague could uh, come and uh, use 50 seconds to say something. And part of the 50 seconds, you say it in your own language because we are, we are really good in English, but we also want to have some spice. Anything that you want to, a reflection or anything? I say good afternoon to everybody in the hall. All protocol duly observed. Um, the first international conference on reshaping education for sustainable development has lived up to its billing as an international conference that has met the need. And for me, it's a time that uh, education is being seen as a critical tool in industrial revolution. And many papers have been presented, and I hope and believe that Africa particularly will not be left behind in the fourth revolution. We've been, have enjoyed ourselves. If you tell me this is your 10th international conference, I will believe it, because right from the first day, you got it right. For me, you, you've done a commendable job. I've enjoyed myself. I've learned a lot. I've interacted with people. And you've advertised yourself and advertised your school in a very great way. And I just hope that we'll not stop at the paper talk, but we'll actually put it into practice through our networking, ensuring that the deliberations and the communications and recommendations made are passed on to the relevant agency. Thank you so much. Oh, well, you said I should speak my language. Actually, Nigeria, we are blessed with so many languages, although I'm Nupe, but I speak Yoruba. So I would say, Adukbe, um, Etishion, Toda. But let me speak the Pidgin. You people, you don't do them well. You do them very well, and we are very grateful. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm so privileged to translate the last part, is that uh, she will miss you a lot. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, a few announcements. Um, we have one colleague who left his bag or her bag in one of the rooms. If you left your bag in one of the rooms, please, uh, there's a lady at the back. Uh, she's got your, ba your, your bag. So please uh, pick it from there. And uh, we're going for lunch now. After lunch, uh, Dr. Bititi and uh, Mr. Solomon, you are there. Those of us who want to go to, uh, to the genocide memorial, where are you? Can you raise so that people see you? Yes, this is the guy. This is the guy that you're going to follow, Solomon. Yeah, and then Mr. Dr. VTT, the gentleman in the corridor there. So thank you so much. Follow them up after lunch, and we do lunch uh, within uh, 45 minutes, so that we are able to travel because we already gave them a schedule. Uh, dear Vice Chancellor, uh, Principal, uh, Convener, Professor Wenceslas, dear colleagues. Uh, on behalf of the whole team that organized this event, did some background work, and on behalf of my colleague Dora, Dorothy, you're there too. Yeah, thank you so much for, for doing this one with us together. We want to appreciate you and wish you the very best as you travel back home. For those who are staying, there's enough room for you so that you don't have to pay for transport back after one year. You may want to stay. God bless you and uh, go in peace. Taking it now.